morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Bienvenue à la réunion. Welcome to num meeting number 107 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Formant, pursuant to the standing orders, members are appearing both in person, in the room, and remotely using the Zoom application. Reminded all comments should be addressed through the chair. Conformément à l'article 183. Pursuant to standing order 1083, the committee resumes its study of report one arrived can refer to the committee on February 12th, 2024. I'd now like to welcome uh, our witnesses from the office of the Auditor General, Andrew Hayes, a Deputy Auditor General, Sami Hanush, Principal. Good to see you both again. Seeing you more than my spouse recently, it seems. Uh, from the Department of Public Works, which, which is a good thing on behalf of taxpayers. Uh, from the Department of Public Works and Government Services, uh, Arian Reza, Reza, pardon me, Arian, Arian Reza, Deputy Minister, pardon me. It's been a long week already. Uh, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming in today. Uh, Catherine Poulet, Assistant Deputy Minister, Departmental Oversight Branch. Dominique Laporte, Assistant Deputy Minister, Procurement Branch. Um, and our two lead principals will each have the floor for five minutes, as is customs. I'll turn to the Office of the Auditor General first. Mr. Hayes, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Monsieur le Président, merci de nous Mr. Chairperson, thank you for inviting us back to discuss our audit report on the Arrive Can application that was tabled on February 12th. I'd like to acknowledge that this hearing is taking place on the unceded ter traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'm accompanied today by Sami Hanush, who was responsible for the audit. The audit examined whether the Canada Border Services Agency, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and Public Services and Procurement Canada had managed all aspects of the Arrive Can application with due regard to the value that would be derived, i.e. value for money. I'll limit my remarks today to the role played by Public Services and Procurement Canada. The department was to in issue and administer contracts on behalf of the CBSA and the Public Health Agency of Canada, where the value of a contract exceeded their delegated procurement authority. We found that Public Services and Procurement Canada had questioned the CBSA's decision to use non-competitive processes to award Arrive Can work. It did suggest alternatives such as shorter non-competitive processes or competitive processes with shorter bidding periods. Despite this advice, the agency decided to proceed on a non-competitive basis. We also reported that the Canada Border Services Agency's overall management of the contracts was very poor. Essential information was missing from awarded contracts and other documents, such as clear deliverables and the qualifications required of workers. We found that contrary to Public Services and Procurement Canada's supply manual, the department co-signed several task authorizations drafted by the Canada Border Services Agency that did not detail task descriptions and deliverables. Without this information, it is difficult to assess whether work was delivered as required and completed on time while providing value for money. Public Services and Procurement Canada also co-signed many of the agency's amendments to task authorizations. Some amendments increased the estimated level of effort or extended the time period without adding new tasks or deliverables. This drove up the contract's value without producing additional benefits. To deliver value for dollars spent and support accountability for the use of public funds, the Canada Border Services Agency and Public Services and Procurement Canada should ensure that tasks and deliverables are clearly defined in contracts and related task authorizations. Mr. Chair, this concludes my opening statement. We would be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Reza, you have the floor for five, up to five minutes, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. As the Deputy Minister of Public Services and Procurement Canada, my team and I are here to continue the important discussion about the Auditor General's report into the development of the Arrive Can application. 
I'm joined today by Dominique Laporte, Assistant Deputy Minister for Procurement, and Catherine Poulain, Assistant Deputy Minister for Departmental Oversight. During the pandemic, my department played a key role in keeping the work of the Government of Canada going, as well as providing key support to provinces and territories. We are particularly proud of our role with regards to the urgent procurement of critical supplies and life-saving vaccines. PSPC has been part of two large audits since the pandemic, one related to the procurement of personal protective equipment and the other to the procurement of vaccines. These audits found in general that the controls and the procurement process worked as they should. However, in the case of ArriveCan, both the Auditor General and the Procurement Ombudsperson have identified areas where the, we need to strengthen our oversight, notably related to documentation and to our procurement processes of IT consultants. We accept these recommendations in full and have already put management actions in place to strengthen our processes on improving and further strengthening our processes, especially when it comes to IT procurement. And we've been working since the fall to do just that. Actions we've taken to date include improving evaluation requirements to ensure resources are properly qualified, requiring increased transparency from suppliers around their price and their use of subcontractors. Third, improving documentation when awarding contracts and issuing task authorizations. Fourth, clarifying work requirements and activities and specifying which activities and which projects are worked off by contractors. In addition, my department is updating its guidance to aid other departments and agencies in procuring responsibly when using our procurement instruments under their own authorities. And finally, PSPC has also taken measures to appoint a senior executive who will be responsible for quality assurance and strengthening documentation within PSPC. Fundamentally, improving IT procurement requires us to ensure those processes are clear and transparent and that the roles, responsibilities, and rules are understood and respected and adhered to. This includes working closely with the Treasury Board Secretariat and client departments and agencies to ensure that procurements are undertaken in a manner that respects the principles of fairness, openness, and transparency. In this regard, both the Treasury Board Directive on the Management of Procurement and PSPC's supply manual stipulate the division of roles and responsibilities. For example, departments, our clients, are responsible for providing a justification for using non-competitive procurements. In the case of procurements related to ArriveCan, the Auditor General's evaluation found that PSPC effectively provided a challenge function to the CBSA and proposed various alternatives to using non-competitive processes, such as running shorter competitive processes or shorter contract periods in the case of the non-competitive approaches. Within the context of the emergency situation brought on by the pandemic, PSPC and our legal counsel found that the justification provided by the CBSA for their approach was sufficient and met the criteria for emergency use. When it comes to lack of transparency around decision-making, we are committed to addressing the root causes, strengthening document management practices, and continuing the deployment of our electronic procurement solution. So that trans transparency in decision-making is ensured and Canadians Parliamentarians can have renewed confidence in the administration of federal procurement activities. New measures that we've put in place have already addressed a number of these areas and we continue to take action to further strengthen the procurement of IT services. En terminant, je sais que les media... In closing, I know that there have been many concerns raised in the media and in parliamentary committees regarding federal procurement and the integrity of the system. We do share those concerns and are actively working to improve the procurement system, as well as undertaking required investigations where warranted. The area of procurement is one that inherently has higher levels of risks associated with in terms of conflicts of interest. And that is why the government requires of all its suppliers, their subcontractors, and all employees to operate lawfully and in a responsible manner by, at a minimum, meeting the expectations and obligations set out in the Code of Conduct for Procurement. For federal public servants, those expectations and obligations are outlined in the Code of Values and Ethics. These codes provide important underpinnings and guiding principles for the work that is done in procurement, and ensuring respect and adherence to these codes is of the utmost importance.
our actions will help reinforce the adher adherence to the codes, improve the way that we do business with companies and further safeguard the integrity of the procurement system. Thank you. Et voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Edward, I saw you had your hand up. It's not up now. Um, did you have a point of order? Okay, just wanted to double check that I uh, didn't, didn't miss you. Uh, turning now to our opening round. Thank you very much for your opening uh, remarks. Um, uh, MP Kuzi, you have the floor for six minutes, please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. This for being here today. Again, thank you very much uh, to the team of the Auditor General for your fantastic report. Um, Madame Reza, I'm glad to see you're in better health this week. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Um, this has not been a good week so far for the Liberal government. Uh, in the meeting that I attended yesterday, we had the Treasury Board Secretariat, including the Comptroller of Canada, agree with the Auditor General and her report that Canadians did not receive value for money for their report. I was also very proud of my team that pushed on the issue of the government employee that received $8 million for a Rive Can while at the same time working in the public service, something that should have never have happened as well as the motion that was passed yesterday by my team in 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 support uh, with the support of the committee uh, to ensure that we are aware of all of uh, the public servants who uh, might potentially be in conflicts of interest with their role in serving the Canadian people. Um, we have a wonderful public service, but of course we must always ensure that there is no conflict of interest. So if this has not been a good week for the Liberal government and a rise scam, and this is evidenced by the media reports today of unfortunately the government members being triggered by the use of the word a rive scam. But today I'm going to focus my questions on the national security exemptions because we have determined already that there was not a value for money for Canadians. So now I'd like to turn to another important aspect, which is the national security exemption. So in April, 2020, your department invoked the national security exemptions to grant GC Strategies, a company that I should add should be entirely banned from, from contracting with the Government of Canada, a $13.9 million uncompetitive contract on behalf of the CBSA. Why did your department feel that GC Strategies was the only company that was able to complete the work necessary on a RiveCan for such a significant amount of money? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I think that first we need to look at uh, the national security invocation. Uh, this is a tool that exists in the trade agreements to give uh, Canada the, the ability in case of crisis to be able to move quickly outside of the uh, current competition. So each trade agreement allows this. So there is not a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the NSC and GC strategies. Rather, uh, the Public Health Agency, uh, CBSA, various departments came forward and said because of the global pandemic, they had a need to move quickly and they would ask us at PSPC for that authority. And in the consultation with uh, uh, legal counsel and uh, PSPC, invocations were, or national security exemptions were granted. And that does not mean or guarantee a sole source strategy or any procurement process. I, I just, I'm just going to pause here because I have an expert in, in NSCs with me in case I've, you no, can, no, Dami? Nothing to add there. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for that response. Um, just a reminder again, and I repeated this yesterday, I'll say it again today, that the Auditor General did stress uh, in her remarks, um, my goodness, close to a month ago now, this is how long her report has resonated with the Canadians, the truth of it, that the pandemic, the crisis situation was not an excuse for the lack of the value for money. I'll follow up on my question, Ms. Reza. In the letter, CBSA, CF, the CBSA CFO wrote to you for the national security exemption. He stated that this contract would be necessary for three months to improve low-touch IT. Why would any company need $13.9 million for, the three month, for three months of work? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chair. I believe that when the um, 
CFO wrote to uh, PSPC seeking the invocation of the national security exemption, it actually described a whole series of different low touch um, technology to keep all of the various border lines open. I don't remember seeing any uh, relation to any one contract or any um, 13.9 million. I know that in the response that PSPC provided, we actually limited in our response saying that their NIC would be valid for a three months period because again, with the, 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 the evolving pandemic, we did not want to give a, a long-term NSC that would uh, create expectations or further uh, contracting requirements. Further to this, uh, the contract in question required a document safeguarding capability security requirement that was not met by GC Strategies. This requirement was removed uh, 14 months after the contract had been initiated. Why were security requirements put in place for a sole source contract that the contractor couldn't even meet? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'm going to ask Madame uh, Bouna to answer. Merci beaucoup pour la question, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chairperson. It's important to make a distinction between a security clearance of an organization or a staff member and capacity that is requested by an organization. It's not necessary for an organization to have that capacity at the moment of the awarding of the contract. When that capacity is required, when a contract is put in place, the organization must have that capacity. So it's normal that a contract be awarded without that capacity being pre-verified by uh, contract security and otherwise there needs to be an amendment to the contract to withdraw that requirement because it's not necessary for GC strategies to carry out their contract. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you to the witnesses. Ms. Yip. Please. Uh, thank you. Ms. Reza, we appreciate you being ready to come to the first scheduled uh, meeting when uh, the meeting was canceled. So thank you for rescheduling to come again. When you are the signing authority for a contract with the client department, um, can you explain the division of responsibilities between what the client department does and what you do? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, these divisions of responsibility between uh, the client department and uh, the contracting authority are actually well documented in the Treasury Board policy on uh, contract management. But I'm going to actually turn to Dominique, who will give us a, a good overview of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy, and thank you. Uh, so in, in terms of the division and role responsibility, it's important to keep in mind that the client will define their requirement, their operational requirement. They define their budget. So basically, they're going to contact the procurement authority with a good or services that they want to procure in mind. And it's up for PSPC to provide an advice in terms of what is the process that is best suited for the procurement of, uh, depending on the nature of the services. Is it a supply arrangement that is in place? Is it a standing offer? So to make sure that the client, and if this is beyond their client delegation, uh, so that they can leverage our tool, so it allows for a process that is usually competitive, is streamlined, and we can also benefit from uh, supply arrangement that do exist. So in terms of uh, our role, we are the contracting authority. So we're going to make sure, for example, that things are within budget. Uh, we take uh, care of the financial evaluation of the the bids received uh, in terms of the technical uh, the, the technical evaluation, this is up to the client. So there's clearly role and responsibility uh, that are spread between the client department and with the contracting authority. And oftentimes it's played by PSPC. Okay. So just to be clear, does the PSPC have the authority to go through and verify the information being provided by client departments? If, if I if I may, Mr. Chair, we certainly do, and uh, this is something that also that has been truly reinforced since uh, November 28 with our client department, and December 4th we send directive to all our staff, making sure that uh, we have also now a task authorization checklist that is very mandatory in terms of requesting information and not necessarily checklist that's been provided by the client, but actually seeing copies of actual CVs, actual attestation of the resources that they give permission to use their name 
claims that their, for example, experience uh, is an accurate representation. So all these things are now being double checked uh, when by PSPC when we're using our authority. Ms. Reza, as the Auditor General noted, PSPC did raise the issue and, and push back in the case of at least one contract that went to GC Strategies. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, in fact, I have, um, our team has shared actually a package of information around that, but to describe that uh, in more detail, you will see that there is an exchange of emails in terms of asking, as we just noted, the sole source justification is the responsibility of the uh, of the department. So they created a sole source justification. The contracting authority pushed back and uh, several times, looking to ensure that the information was accurate, that uh, it was really uh, clear that we had to be convinced that there was only one IT firm that could provide staff augmentation in this, uh, looking at the timelines that were provided. So there's a whole series of steps uh, where there was a challenge function uh, at the DG level uh, within CVSA to outline specifically what was required to be able to move forward. Sorry, I did not hear your last sentence. I don't know if the mic didn't pick up. Uh, apologies. Um, I just uh, ended by saying that there was a whole series of steps that were outlined in the uh, email to CVSA asking for further information to be able to uh, document the file and to satisfy PSPC's challenge function on the sole source justification, the length of the contract, why they were not um, looking at different options. In emergency situations like we saw in the pandemic, while we weren't able to run full competitions, we kept defaulting to quick competitions of 5, 10, 15 days to try to ensure that we were using competitive tools. And um, how, how did those quick competitions go? Uh, thank you very much for the question. The quick competitions worked very well across a broad uh, range of commodities and PPE and various logistic pieces that we put in place. Um, what authority does PSPC have to reject a contract request from client departments? Thank you very much for the question. I'm going to turn to Dominique for a technical answer. So I, I think in terms of our authority, I think we have to be careful when we allow department to use our procurement instrument, whether it's a standing offer, supply arrangement. Our role is to play a challenge function, making sure that people do abide by the role of being open, open and fair and transparent procurement. Uh, this is an interesting question that you're raising. And to what extent can we say basically no to the client? Here, I think in the context of the pandemic, you have to remember the context of CBS's employees. Uh, it was very difficult to have them at the, the border station. So all these elements uh, would basically kind of make it a bit more challenging to play a challenge function back then. But I have to say that in the context of regular challenge function, uh, eventually we're going to say no. And we've been, we've been saying no to clients in the past uh, that they're not going to be able to leverage some of our procurement vehicle if they don't, for example, uh, abide to the terms of condition of them. So. Et voilà, thank you. That is the time for, for that uh, segment. Uh, maintenant, c'est Mr. Lemire. Bonjour. Vous avez six Bonjour. minutes. You have six minutes, Mr. Lemire. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and thank you to the witnesses for their reports at this in, in this important study. In the Auditor General's uh, study, paragraph 151, we noted that uh, Procurement Canada, as the central authority for contracting and procurement, initially called into question the decision of CBSA officials to propose and use sole source contracting for ArriveCan and proposed other alternative solutions such as a competitive process that would be shorter, 10 days for example, or contracting period that would be shorter as part of a non-competitive process. Now, in your opening remarks, you confirmed this state of affairs. So we know that uh, Public Services and Procurement Canada challenged some of the CBSA's decisions with respect to Ri ArriveCan, but we don't have access to those emails. In a pre previous uh, correspondence, apparently inf emails can be recovered for a period of 30 days, and yet the Treasury Board Secretariat yesterday intimated that it would be a period of six months for the recovery of emails. Can you confirm either or, please? Uh, 
Uh, merci pour la question. Thank you very much for your question. We'll have to go back and see what the policy is when it comes to retaining documentation. Yesterday, we shared emails with the clerk of the committee that requ were requested by committee members. Moreover, we still haven't received the emails that we asked at committee, and yet the Auditor General already had those in her possession. Why is it taking so long to get those emails to us? And we'd remind you the role of elective officials to shed light on these issues. Parliamentarians play a central role when it comes to transparency of information, and this is crucial to us fulfilling our mandate. Thank you very much for the question, Mr Chairperson. We're doing our utmost normally it takes between a fortnight or th and three weeks um, to submit documents. We get them translated and then we send them through as soon as possible. We do our very best. I don't know if Dominique can tack on to that. Yes, indeed, These doc those documents are being translated. Some were tabled with the committee yesterday. We're acting very diligently, and we always do so when we receive such a request. Of course, translation takes time, but uh, if those doc emails aren't tabled today, it'll be in the upcoming days. We only appeared here a couple of weeks back, and it takes time to get our hands on the emails and get the appropriate uh, approvals, but they're on their way if they're not already with you. Question, well, I'm glad to know that you're taking this seriously. It's absolutely crucial that we have access to these emails so that we understand what the contracting authorities uh, did so that we can avoid a recurrence of this kind of situation. We know that this has been highly... Uh, this has uh, really been part, covered at length by the media. Have you had a, a crisis cell put in place? Where does the buck stop and who should we be pointing the finger at when it comes to arrive can? I'll start in French and then perhaps I'll finish in English. We've reflected on that issue at length. During the pandemic, in the procurement department, we awarded about 16,000 contracts for a total value of $20 billion. A period for $20 billion worth of procurement on PPE, on vaccine procurements, on logistics. With a workforce of a thousand, approximately a thousand employees and executives working in this field. We did our best to make sure that we had records, governance was taking place, that we were supporting a vast array of not only clients, but in this period of time that we're talking about, the provinces and territories turned toward us for assistance with their acquisitions for, their, for hospitals, spooling up logistic trains. So there was a lot of different pieces going on with the same workforce trying to meet a breadth of needs that were very specific. So in terms of how we normally do things, there are many different hands working on many different contracts. It is not a one-to-one -one relationship. We support all of our clients and we try to provide that level of due diligence and framework that we put in place to ensure that the rules are followed for transparency and openness and that there's best value in the procurement process. I'll stop there and I'll hand the floor to Dominique. Well, I don't know if you're referring specifically to ArriveCan, but our department uh, didn't have any uh, contracts with respect to ArriveCan, and it's important to clarify that. We provided IT services to the CBSA, but uh, when it comes to crisis management, there was no ArriveCan file with the, in our department. So we provided, as I said, IT services to the CBSA. Well, one can't conclude that this contracting process was carried out properly, given the complexity of the ecosystem of the management of the borders. But uh, did the government give you the tools you required to succeed? Did you have the leeway to succeed in this project from an IT standpoint? Thank you for the question. I think that that would be a greater, better question for the CBSA itself.
They have it. Your time is up. It's a speed. Um, MP Vidout, you have the floor for up to six minutes, please. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. First, I am shocked at what was discovered at the Arrive Can report. I can't believe nearly 60 million in contracts were awarded to companies and CEOs who did so little work to earn it. I am shocked at the lack of accountability measures. I am shocked that this company com claimed to be an indigenous business. The $60 million that went to profits could have been made, could have made a world of difference in my writing. It could have gone towards a harvester support grant and funding for community food programs that help to alleviate food insecurity, a condition imposed by decades of the lack of investments by successive liberal and conservative governments. This liberal government is looking to sunset this important program that, su that supports hunters to provide for families and communities. Groceries and supplies are too costly and most families cannot afford them. How, I ask, is it always acceptable with this government to find nearly 60 million to justify a handful, just to, ha just to a handful of CEOs and well-connected insiders? My first question will be to the deputy minister. I myself cannot go to my constituents to even try to justify to them that a RIFCAN app was worth it. I am asking you to speak to the families in my riding that cannot afford basic groceries because the programs designed to lower their costs are not working. Can I'm asking you through the chair to explain to them why this government let some CEOs walk away with millions. Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Uh, the issue that has been uh, uncovered in the last week on Dalian and uh, their use of contracting, their employment is egregious. It's wrong and it is a terrible situation. I myself have picked up the phone to speak to the RCMP commissioner. They've been suspended. Uh, so action is being taken. So I, I empathize that the situation is not acceptable. It has come to our attention, and we have moved as swiftly as possible to do something about it. Mr. Chair, in yesterday's testimony, this committee was told that the Liberals and, some, and Conservatives together awarded a total value of contracts to GCS strategies to Dillian, Coradix, and Coradel systems of around $107 million. Are you of the opinion that Canadians got full value for their money out of those contracts? Um, thank you for the, the question. Those contracts span many years and many different departments who have had work done by those uh, firms. Those firms have provided a variety of services, mostly in the uh, professional services IT staff augmentation, which is in-house is support to in-house priorities and deliverables. And they have indicated that they have received value. And where there is questionable value, as we've seen by the AG's report, uh, actions are being taken to examine further measures. I will now turn about the decision-making process around the suspensions of GCS strategies, Dillian and Cordix, uh, that was announced yesterday. Uh, through the chair, can you tell this committee when the decision was made to review the security credentials of these companies and what the motivations for that re review were? Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Madame Poulin. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So um, I will go one by one. Uh, if we're talking about uh, Dalian, a decision has been made uh, to revoke the security clearance of the organization. This is mainly based on the fact that Dalian has two key, new, key senior officials representing the company vis-a-vis uh, -vis the contract security program. 
uh, when we are informed uh, that there are allegations against uh, or the company or a key senior officials, we need to verify uh, and uh, support uh, the evidence to see if it's in, against the control or what is required uh, from the individual or the company to be in good standing with the contract security program. As we were informed that a key senior official was also a full-time employee in one of the departments, this is against uh, the exigence or the control of the program. So we were able to support that allegation very fast, and we were in a position to suspend the security clearance of the key senior official, as well as the security clearance of the organization. If I'm going to GC strategy, we re it's the same uh, process that we are using in order to assess the compliance of the, the organization vis-a-vis -vis the contract security program. We received allegations. However, allegations are not enough to support a decision to suspend. We need to support this by evidence. And as soon as we got enough evidence to support the decision, we decided to suspend the security clearance of the key senior official as well as the company. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the time that finishes our first round. Uh, beginning now, second round with uh, Mr. Barrett, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Has PSPC been outright banned from, excuse me, has PSPC uh, outright banned GC strategies from receiving any and all gov government contracts? So we have two tools that we use. Thank you very much for your question. One is a procurement stop work order for 180 days. So that's in place across the, the system. And we have a second tool, which is a heavy hammer in terms of security. So if you don't hold a security, you can't do business. So both tools are in place. So right now we're working across the system to terminate contracts and, and no new work. So is that a pause or is that a prohibition? They, Let's just both, use plain language so that people I, yeah, understand. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, putting it in place in, in my head. The suspension, and I'll learn here, is a prohibition until further notice. If there's more information that's forthcoming, if that's the RCP pause. invocation, well, I mean, it can't be into, for, for all intents and purposes, it can't be into perpetuity without some type of recourse. So we consider them suspensions, and there would have to be a very high uh, response to get it back. It seems very doubtful at this stage, but I'm going to turn it again to Dominique. I'm just happy to add very quickly on that. So they're currently suspended for 180 days. At the same time, we are seriously looking at termination. So uh, basically, we want to make sure that those decisions are not made lightly. Uh, so we want to make sure that I do receive evidence eventually from my colleagues that we're going to be taking that into account. Uh, and if the grounds are sufficient for termination, if it's basically it validates the grounds that we had for the suspension, we'll proceed with the termination. Let me, let me run something by you, very specifically in the case of GC Strategies. We had the principal for GC Strategies, Mr. Firth, at a parliamentary committee. Uh, the testimony, I'm certain that, you, that you're that uh, you privy to, and you've seen it, where he admitted to falsifying information that he used to win a bid. He lied, and he, he admitted that at committee. And so um, w whether or not the RCMP can use that in a criminal investigation, separate question, but can PSPC use it? He admitted to to fraudulent activity in order to win bids for the government of, from the government of Canada. Is that, is that not enough? And, and, and he also uh, has been caught multiple times uh, objectively lying to a parliamentary committee. But is, the, is fraud and forgery not sufficient grounds to, to ban, to blacklist, to, to have a uh, prohibition in perpetuity for a contractor when we're talking about tax dollars? Femi, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. What is said and also in front of committee, we have to be careful with that. So it does not necessarily, can we transpose that and use that? Again, I would say we start with the suspension. The desired effect is accomplished. Basically, the company can no longer secure any government contracts, cannot no longer do business. And we take the time because we want to make it right. If we're going to be terminating, we want to make sure that the supplier is not able to come back and allege grounds that for whatever reason, uh, this person was not properly terminated. So. 
Mr. Laporte? They're, they're not being paid, to, to my knowledge, they're not being paid by PSPC for any contract that is being Do done. they have any contracts with the Government of Canada, any ongoing contracts with Social Sciences and Humanity Research Council of Canada, for example? There was a call-out that was done by TBS, and it did not indicate that there was any outstanding contract with, uh, with them or payment that were being made. So you, you're confirming today that, that GC Strategies has no ongoing business with the Government of Canada? This is my understanding, and I would be pleased to validate that with the, uh, the committee. So you'll validate that. You'll report back to the committee, but, but I'll, we'll take your answer yep. um, mm -hmm. at, at face value. The Thank you, just Mr. Bear. So uh, the committee looks forward to that for that validation. I appreciate your answer today. The, the, it was a request, and you acknowledge you could validate that. We look forward to that. Thank you. Mr. Barrett, you have a minute, five seconds. How many uh, instances or contracts did for, did GC Strategies use false information in order to win the bids? Thank you very much for the question. We actually, I think, at a uh, request of Ogle, looked at two areas of all active contracts with the three suppliers in terms of their security and their CVs. And in fact, Catherine's shop um, led the investigation. Merci beaucoup, uh, tel que mentionné la Thank you very much. As the Deputy Minister mentioned, we conducted due diligence as soon as this matter was uh, brought to our attention and we worked with departments and agencies that are active contracts with them to assess two things in particular. Did those individuals have the proper security clearance to work on these contracts and were they who they claimed to be? We also worked with the companies, suppliers to provide CVs and those CVs were shared with departments and agencies in order to ensure that uh, they were properly categorized and that they had the le requisite levels. Uh, Ma'am, I, I appreciate the, 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 the process. I'm looking for a number of occurrences. During that verification process that uh, started in the recent months. Next is Ms. Bradford. You have the floor for Chair, five minutes, point please. of order. Uh, just one second, Ms. Bradford. Uh, yes. the, the the response from the witness was uh, was not captured in uh, in interpretation. Oh. So uh, if we could have it, uh, the, the the completeness of her answer was not captured. So if she could restate and we could have it sure. uh, translated. I very look good. Forward to that, that, response. that is. Uh, would you mind just repeating that uh, en français ou en, ou en anglais? C'est votre choix. Puis uh, we'll just make sure that the translation is working. Aucun problème. Mais... No problems whatsoever, Mr. Chairperson. So I conclude my response by saying that the verification of security clearances and CVs of the resources provided by the suppliers demonstrated no exceptions that would warrant intervening in the contracting process. The interpreter would point out that the microphone was switched off. Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. So I want to look at the area of delegated authority. So for the deputy minister, can you describe for the committee, please, more about delegated authorities and how those work and what goes to a minister and what doesn't? Thank you very much for the question. Um, there's a, a couple of different lenses to this. There is uh, the delegated authority from the Financial Administration Act. And uh, often when you have to run a department, the minister has to be able to delegate authorities to the deputy minister and to the, uh, em the executives and employees below. So de different levels of the organization receive the training to be able to exercise their delegated responsibility when it comes to financial controls. Can you sign for a budget? Can you um, provide assurances that you've received the goods and services that were received? On the contracting front, it's a very similar kind of delegation instrument of contracting authorities. Uh, it is something that is refreshed frequently, and usually the delegation of authority in terms of what the minister or the deputy or the assistant deputy minister signs off and on authority to enter into contracts uh, is dependent on risk, uh, material level, uh, various elements. In non-COVID non, in non -COVID times, um, the minister has delegated the uh, administer of public services and procurement has delegated uh, their authority to the position of assistant deputy minister and in some cases below and during the pandemic there was a updated uh, set of, of delegated authorities that were put in place with uh, the support of treasury board because we just couldn't keep up with the existing levels so we provided uh, various elements and staff training around the new delegation instruments. 
Uh, what sort of volume of contracts are we talking about on an annual basis? Thank you very much for the question. I think this is a really important question as we look at, you know, the procurement function of the government of Canada going forward, what we need to deliver to support uh, government priorities as well as how we actually structure our procurements. So what's important here is when you think about uh, procurement, there's approximately 450,000 trans transactions that are procurement related done on an annual basis across the government of Canada. At PSPC, we do approximately 16,000 of these transactions, which roughly translate into the contracts. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one because there's amendments and other elements. And so while we do a very small percentage of PSPC as a contract authority of the government's procurement function, the rest is done under um, department's own authorities and their own contracting authorities and financial authorities. But those that we do actually represents about $20 billion a year of procurement on a basis, on a spend, on an annual spend of the government of Canada, which I believe is around $34 billion. So what, what could the impact be if the delegated authority wasn't in place and everything had to go through the minister? Um, it, it, would not, it, it would not be doable if you just look at the volumes, the risk, the complexity, the training a procurement officer has to be able to challenge function, to be able to ensure that a, prop, a file is properly documented. It would just be impossible. In, in many instances, files of a certain volume, complexity, risk go to Treasury Board, and even that is a challenge to be able to try to keep up with the volume. And it would. I, I'll just pause here. The meek. I fully agree with the, the deputy. I would say that ultimately uh, Canadian wouldn't get the service that they, they deserve from the Canadian government. It would stall the entire machine. Okay, so PSPC has suspended the task or authorization authority for all 87 departments and agency it contracts for when it comes to IT professional services, not just for uh, CBSA, not just for the companies involved in the RICAM, but everybody. PSPC is negotiating new agreements with these departments and agencies to ensure more rigor in contracting. Can you tell us about what will be different in these new agreements versus how things were done previously? Thank you very much for the question. And before I turn to Dominique, I, I do want to say that I think it's really important that the ground set that the reason we're doing this across um, the professional services, IT staff augmentation, and in general, how we manage task authorizations is that the comments that came from the report we're around the actual tool and making sure that we're using it to ensure that there is best value, clear deliverables, so that we're able, when we do get audited or when we want to go back and look at the decision making, there's a clear evidentiary trail. So we decided that we need to really look at it across the whole commodity to make sure that we were providing best value in the procurement process. The yeah, uh, no, very, very good point have been raised. So in addition, what we want is to make sure that we stay away from broad general task description and ensuring that the required skill set is not too wide. So this is also to response to the Auditor General Recommendation 1.73 uh, that was formulated to PSPC. Uh, improving the evaluation requirement, uh, basically making sure that when we look at CVs, it's not only basically at the contract award stage, but also at the TA stage, uh, and also making sure that, and I did allude to that, that uh, we get from the client actual evidence uh, of the CVs of the resources that are being proposed, uh, that the, those resources a test of the accuracy of their experience and that also they provide their authorization to use the CV by, uh, uh, by, by a bidder or supplier. So all those steps and addition are being taken. Greater transparency, I would say. Uh, we want also to know who are going to be the subcontractor that are going to be used. Use. Uh, so what is what are in terms of daily rate they're going to be providing. So there's a new requirement that are all incorporated into what we call the task authorization checklist that has now become mandatory to use our tool, our supplier arrangement so if client did not comply with this new tool they're not going to be able to use that so that will bring a lot of additional discipline in terms of that making sure that uh, you know tasks are clearly defined it's linked also to a specific outcome security requirements are being met so there are also requirements for security requirement uh, so tons of new requirement and also and when we're dealing with contract amendment 
we want to make sure that there's a true reason for that contract amendment. Uh, is the scope increasing? Uh, so what are the, the reasons? And what's the obligation to proceed? So uh, our officers are going to be performing much more challenge in future that they've been in the past. And not only basically being satisfied that they asked the client, but looking at the actual evidence that is, it is provided. And most importantly, and this was also outlined by the Auditor General, that everything is documented. So we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on proper documentation. Uh, so that would help. And we're also leveraging our new EPS. Uh, so, uh, so electronic procurement sure system. Thank you. I appreciate it. That, that went over, but I wanted to make sure we had a fulsome answer from you and your uh, department. Uh, turning Thank now you. to uh, uh, encore une fois, Mr. Lemire. Was Mr. Lemire, you have two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Let's talk about Dalian. The CEO and founder of the firm was a both a private consultant and a public servant, according to La Presse. The value of the contracts obtained by Dalian since 2018 are billions of dollars, three billions of dollars uh, from National Defence, based on the public accounts data. The department didn't clarify whether Mr. Yao had been suspended with or without pay for uh, during an internal investigation. According to La Presse, they double dipped as both a public servant and a contract worker. In the contracting process involving companies like Dalian, I understand that there are no checks that are made. These are, this is a company that has, has cut contracts with the government since 2018 to the tune of over $50 billion, and the CEO is a public servant. How do you explain that? Thank you very much for the question. Well, right off the bat, it's important to understand that there are multiple codes, ethics codes. We have a responsibility as... A, A supplier has a responsibility under code of ethics codes. Their responsibility. They have, when, as a public servant, you have as a condition of employment a requirement to declare your conflicts of interest. So on that side, um, you know, I believe that this committee has asked uh, colleagues from the Department of Defense to come and speak to the actions that they're taking. But I think it's very important in terms of a general response to understand that the system is that we have a framework to prevent and detect and respond to conflicts of interest. So many different measures and triggers have been put in place by this. When we know about it, we act on it. The onus is on both the public servant and the uh, contractor to be able to disclose any potential conflicts. This is a very unusual situation. I believe that we've been asked to come back and provide more detail on other um, similar cases that we know about. And I just want to close by saying that the PSPC... Uh, je veux... Therefore, I'd just like to add one thing. In the, last, in the course of the last year, we have laid off five employees who failed to declare a conflict of interest. And we fired five of them. And... Each and every time we lay someone off for public service wrongdoing, it's on the open data site of the Government of Canada that it's published. So you do this verification after the fact and not when you hire the individual response. When we hire a person, before you sign your letter of offer, you have to fill out a form that states your conflicts of interest, and at that point, a decision is made. Next up again, um, Ms. Lidout, you have lit it out. You have the floor for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am Ms. Idlout, just so that I can help you. Yes, thank you, Idlout. Yes, I, I stumbled there again, but Idlout. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, as I said in my er uh, earlier opening statement, I said that I was shocked that uh, the uh, arrive uh, cam app was awarded to a business that claimed to be indigenous. So I want to ask about the procurement process, uh, but first I would like to ask uh, the deputy minister if, if it's a priority of this government to ensure that indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs receive contracts. If so, uh, can, can the deputy uh, minister explain why? Uh, thank you very much for the question. 
This is indeed a very uh, key deliverable of the government of Canada as it relates to procurement, as it relates to truth and reconciliation, as it relates to some of the work that's been done uh, at Parliament and various committees and some of the reports that have come out. Putting a floor of putting a 5% um, set aside or 5% of the government of Canada spend on uh, procurement going to Indigenous firms is a goal that the government is actively pursuing. As part of that, the Indigenous Services uh, Canada, the Department of Indigenous Services of Canada, has a, uh, a directory of Indigenous suppliers that have qualified so that uh, when the government is looking to fulfill various goods and services and looking to procure solicitation documents, that directory is consulted and we make targeted efforts in various communities across uh, Canada and various First Nations to try to use economic levers to encourage various Indigenous SMEs to come and compete to uh, federal procurement opportunities. Uh, did anyone in the department or did the deputy minister check to see if this the, uh, the recipient of this contract was a part of that registry? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, officials that were looking at the contracting uh, did confirm with the Indigenous Services Solution, or excuse me, Indigenous Services Canada, that they were a member in good standing on the uh, Indigenous Business Directory. That being said, we did ask them to carry out further audits as more and more information came to light, and that audit is underway uh, with colleagues in Indigenous Services uh, Canada. Did anyone contact Alderville First Nations to verify that Mr. Eo is a member of that community? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I believe this is underway with uh, Indigenous Services Canada. Thank you. That is your time. Next up, we have Mr. Genuis. You have the floor for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just picking up on the issue of Indigenous procurement, uh, Dalian's uh, identity as an Indigenous company as part of the set-aside for Indigenous procurement uh, is obviously absurd and a manipulation of the of the intention of the policy. Uh, the intention of the policy presumably is to give opportunities uh, to, to Indigenous Canadians to be able to work in jobs that flow from government procurement. Uh, but this was a company that simply received contracts and subcontracted them, uh, taking a cut uh, along the way. There were no opportunities created uh, for Indigenous people as a result of this. You mentioned a, a, a registry or a list of Indigenous companies that are used when considering this 5% uh, set aside. Um, what percentage of those companies uh, actually create jobs for Indigenous peoples in Canada? Thank you very much for your question. I actually don't have that information. I will <coughs> refer the question to Indigenous Services Canada. There's about 2,600 companies on that list in various um, commodity areas. Okay, I, I think we need to get further information at, at this committee or elsewhere about to what extent those those companies uh, should really qualify in terms of the actual objective of the policy, creating opportunities for Indigenous Canadians. Ms. Rosa, I want to ask you about staff augmentation. You spoke at the Government Operation Committee about this. You said, uh, quote, traditionally staff augment augmentation works in a similar matter where you bring in a temp agency and they're asked taking on the burden of finding the resources. There are many shops that do this across the system, so there are about 635 IT firms that provide staff augmentation resources. So Canadians have become familiar with three companies, uh, Carotex, Dalian, and GC Strategies, that receive work and subcontract, uh, often without providing any actual value themselves. Uh, but, but this is an incredible number. We're not just talking about three companies, 635 companies. Uh, so why is this practice of multi-level subcontracting so common that there are 635 different companies that are doing it? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, first off, there's 635 companies that provide task-based IT professional services. So in terms of why there are so many, I mean, the government of Canada has various priorities that need to be filled by niche uh, skill sets on IT professionals. In terms of your question about... Uh, Sorry, but just to the clarify, these, these, are, these are folks doing staff augmentation, which you defined before the Government Operations Committee, not as doing the actual IT work, but as but as doing the work of finding people who can do the work. So why why can't the Government of Canada just 
kind of maintain a database of, of, of external resources who have this expertise, instead of going to 635 different companies to act as middlemen, why can't they just keep a registry of those who are capable of doing the work to perform specific tasks? Right. Thank you very much for the question. I think I received a similar question recently, and I think that the traditional model, if you permit, is like having a general contractor when you need to find somebody with a specific, you know, an electrician or a certified plumber. So now what is being proposed is that we don't use that skill set that has been very helpful for us in the past to find the resources when we need to bring them in, regardless of whether it's IT or other staff augmentation, and to provide have a data set where we can type in and say, well, we need five IT engineers or, or five computer science graduates. And we're taking that on. We're looking at various elements. And I believe that we actually have a module that is a potential for us to be able to do that. But again, and, it's going to require a lot of administration now. That well, just, 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 just to clarify the question, though, I mean, I, I think the idea of having someone who has a general contracting function who, who oversees the process of, of, of finding uh, those external resources necessary, I mean, someone needs to be in charge of the, the, the project, but, but I just don't understand why that general contracting function can't be a public servant, why there can't be someone inside of government who has that skill set of knowing uh, w where these these uh, different resources are and and being able to consult the appropriate uh, database. I, and I do want to ask you specifically, how many of these 635 middlemen companies have two employees or less? Thank you very much. I believe that is an outstanding question that we're working on. The list is is publicly available, all the companies that are on it, but we're trying to work to see to provide the breakdown. Some of them are very large companies that are well known. Some of them are very small, as we've indicated. Okay, so just to clarify, you are in the process of providing to this committee uh, the the details of how many employees each of those 635 companies have, and when can we expect that information? Uh, I'm not sure if this is for this committee or OGO, and I know that we're looking at it. I'm just looking over here. Do we have further information? Uh, I don't think we have further information to share right now. We'll just be careful. Hey, just, just to clarify, we, we would like that information at this committee as well, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you can provide that, please. Do you agree to, to do that? Yeah, to do, thank yeah. you. Sorry, you you finish your response? Though, no, please, that's please. fine. Uh, I just I just wanted okay. to say also we have to be careful not to paint all suppliers with the same brush. You know, of these three companies, some but, of them. But, are but they're all doing that staff Mr. augmentation Mr. work Mr. or subcontract. Your 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 time is up. Thank you. But would you if, if you'd like to finish your your answer briefly? Because time is. A lot. Go ahead. Say that we have three companies that are be re that have been under the radar. We have to be careful because we have legit suppliers that provide truly value added to the government of Canada. So I would be careful before we have no the evidence that basically it's systemic that we we don't paint all these suppliers with the same brush. I think we just have to be mindful. Thank you of that. very much, Sriva. It's uh, Miss Shanahan. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Well, thank you, Chair, and I too thank the witnesses for being here because uh, it, it, we've had uh, um, occasion uh, to expect that we would be questioning these witnesses, and that didn't happen in the past. It was abruptly uh, cancelled. So uh, good to see the witnesses here. And uh, just continuing on, on that line, um, it's a reminder, I think, to all colleagues that in this committee, uh, we're not here to micromanage. Um, uh, you know, interesting to hear that um, uh, my conservative colleague uh, supports um, us uh, uh, hiring uh, more qualified uh, public servants, and I hope that that uh, would continue to be the case and that they would not be under the fear of being uh, abruptly fired at any future time because somebody uh, thinks that that's a good move uh, to make. Because uh, as we have seen, it has long-term consequences to the professionalism, to the expertise, and to the ca capacity of the uh, public service to indeed effectively um, carry out and monitor the work that is being done. Uh, and I am glad to see the deputy minister here because I want to um, emphasize the fact that it, it is with deputy ministers that this uh, committee conducts its work. Uh, and uh, so just in, in the interest of contrast, I would like to ask um, what role does the minister or the minister's office play in selecting bidders? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, zero role. So in terms of what the minister does, uh, the minute, you know, procurement from a PSPC perspective, fair, open, and transparent. And there is a very clear delineation 
between what is done in the public service and what is uh, discussed uh, with the minister. The minister is briefed on outcomes of procurement, focus on the fairness and the transparency of various elements, and on things that we're doing to improve in procurement. We are very much interested in procurement modernization. He's been briefed on various elements of that. You know, having discussions on what we can do for better, better vendor performance management, for better integrity, how we do price substantiation, what are the risk mitigation controls? Those are appropriate roles for the Minister of Public Works. I mean, um, there's various elements here, and as I noted earlier, there's been a lot of delegation of responsibilities to ensure there's no political interference. If, if I, thank you. Please continue, because I'm very concerned about, about that. Uh, you know, I, th I think Canadians want to be reassured that there is no political interference uh, with the procurement uh, process and indeed any investigations that uh, come thereafter because, uh, you know, any matter of um, harmful effects could uh, could arrive. So Please continue. There is a, a lot of emphasis put on this in terms of the quality of our briefing, ensuring that minister is aware of things that are happening where a decision has been taken. When there are active procurements, there is a prohibition uh, to meet on various elements. Meetings occur. They are always with a public servant official present. We put a focus on fairness. Uh, we have fairness monitoring. So we really take this very seriously and the ministers have all been very uh, serious and aware and alive to this issue. I would also note, for example, when we were doing vaccine procurement, we all uh, signed additional over and above our regular conflicts of interest. We had both the public sector and the minister, I think the minnow and the ministers all sign off to ensure that uh, there was due diligence being done, there was control to separate the political and uh, private, uh, excuse me, public sector aspects. Well, well, thank you. And and on that note, um, it was uh, recently uh, reported uh, that um, uh, the current minister uh, was not uh, briefed on Arrive Can as part of the hot issue section of his transition binder. Now, uh, PSPC has had seven ministers over the last 10 years, so uh, it would seem to me that your department has experience with transition. Um, not everything can, can be continued, uh, can be uh, included in the binder, um, but uh, can you tell us about how uh, th uh, those priority issues are triaged and uh, prepared? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think that it's reasonable to say that, uh, you know, the binder is to provide an overview of the key issues in front of the department. Uh, you know, we at PSPC do more than procurement. We are the Receiver General of Canada. We do the translation for the government of Canada. We do defense procurement. There are many different, we are the custodian of real property. So there is a whole slew of things that need to be uh, briefed and provided in terms of legislation acts. And in that first run up of uh, July, we wanted to focus on what was uh, immediate, as you indicated. Yes, and, and indeed, uh, Deputy Minister, with that, the fact that, that not a single question was raised about the issue by the opposition in question period. Thank for you, Ms. Shanahan. That is your time. You are, well, you are well, you are well, well over. Thank you very uh, much. Oh well, you've been you've been good with the time, Chair. I I have. I, I think I I think I gave Miss uh, Miss Bradford well over a minute, but that does not mean I extended to uh, every minister, <laughs> every every minister, <laughs> and. Uh, and every every uh, every member and of course the government side has many more time slots you'll be able to return to to this um turning now for beginning our third round uh turning now to miss koozie you have the floor for oh is it mr genuous pardon me turning to mr genuous you have the floor for five minutes please uh, thank you, Chair. I want to ask specifically about Liberal Minister of Procurement, John Eve Duclos. Uh, we've just heard some questions about the role of the minister. Uh, we're supposed to have a system of ministerial accountability, uh, but you've just said that the minister effectively has, has no role in actual procurement. Given that his title is Minister of Procurement, I'm just trying to understand what does John Eve Duclos do all day as Minister of Procurement? Thank you very much for the question. Just to clarify, I was speaking about active procurement where there's open bids. Okay, so when it comes to Arrive Can, you have the, the decision made 
you have the ensuing problems and scandals, the policies related to it. Your department advised CBSA that there's that there are problems here. Um, and it, are we to believe that all throughout this process, not not just while the, the bid is actually open, but all throughout this process, uh, there is no role for the minister or the minister's office? Thank you very much for the question. I think it might be helpful just to give a little bit of a historical context. So uh, just it, have to be very brief because I have five minutes. I'm not, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm very respectful okay. in the sense that I okay. try to okay. answer the questions very quickly. Okay. In I'll, I'll interrupt in 30 seconds. When, when the, the first contracts were being let, there was no mention of arrive camp. So any briefing that was being provided to the minister at that time was all hands on deck. Every department needs certain um, additional support to keep everything open, including the border. So that would have been that level of briefing. As arrive can became more of a, uh, a bespoke name things, briefing started to come more into that area. In 2022, there was QPNOS. This is a traditional way to brief. You ask about the Minister Duclos. Minister Duclos has been briefed on many different aspects of it. You ask about what is the responsibility of the Minister of Public, of PSPC. We have everything from the security to contract integrity. These are areas of uh, Okay, okay. Now I'm, I'm going to jump in. Thank you. And, and you'll have a chance to respond again. But oh, 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 since the pandemic started, there have been four liberal ministers of, of uh, procurement. Anita Nan, Filmina Tassi, Helena Jasek, and now Jean-Yves Duclos. Four, four ministers in about four years. Um, is it reasonable to assume that all four of them have been briefed about either Arrive Can or the Arrive Can project before it, it had that name. And then uh, is, is the process of engaging ministers, are they actually providing policy direction? Are they raising concerns about aspects of the process? Uh, because you talked a lot about ministers being briefed about things, um, but I would expect it's not just a one-way dialogue where you're sort of telling the spokesman for the department what to say if it comes up in the House of Commons, but they're actually uh, providing some kind of direction or raising concern about things that they're hearing. Uh, so can I assume all four were briefed uh, to some extent at certain points in time? And at what points did they offer uh, responses, raise policy concerns, suggest adjustments in direction, et cetera? I cannot speak in detail to the first one or two. When I became associate deputy and deputy minister, I have more familiarity with the briefings. They were briefed, engaged on the issues that we're facing now. And, you know, what is the plan? You know, is the procurement ombudsman engaged? Is the AG engaged? These are the kind of discussions that are going on in terms of, is there a substantive issue? How is it being fixed? What are the risk mitigation strategies? What are the considerations? Okay, so they were briefed. They asked questions. Um, you're not really describing a process in which the minister is is coming in and saying, well, there's a problem here, you need to fix this. You're not describing a system in which ministers are providing direction. You're just describing a system in which ministers are briefed and then asking questions. Would you say that ministers were actively providing uh, corrective direction on policy issues throughout the process, or were ministers being briefed and asking questions about what you were doing as a department? Thank you very much for the question. Um, it's an interesting uh, question that you asked because the financial delegations and the accountabilities lack, you know, rest with the CBSA. So when we're briefing the minister of PSPC, we're providing some procurement observations, but on the spend, on the record keeping, on the controls, on whether or not no, no, but ma'am, you you you, under, you, under, are, you, you understand are, my point though. You're like you're providing information to the a person whose title is the Minister of Procurement. And we have a system in which Canadians expect that minister to take responsibility for what happens in their department. Uh, but, but, but the way this is being framed, including by Liberal Great members, question, is that the minister is just sort of a, a passive passenger receiving briefings, like, like students at a seminar, listening to what they're being told by the experts and thank asking you. interesting like, questions along the thank way. Thank you. I like a, Isn't that a problem? Ms. Ginger, thank you. A, a brief response, please. I would say... Minister Duclos has taken an active role. Minister Duclos has been uh, briefed by the um, Auditor General. We're looking at the whole issue and making sure that we have the direction set to move forward. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Ms. Khalid. You have the floor for five minutes, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I find it very interesting how hard the Conservatives are trying to tie this to a minister when we have heard time and time again from so many different department officials that there was no minister that was linked to this. So like, I, I'll, I'll leave that there. And I, you know, like, I also wonder how much money the Conservatives have spent calling in committee meetings to find out uh, and how they can scramble to, to to link this to a minister, to, to link this to some kind of big conspiracy, which clearly they're not finding. I wonder how many millions of dollars they're going to spend just to try to, to, to get their political points in. But I, I do also want to express how disappointed I was when I read the, the Auditor General's report. I don't want to see the lack of transparency within the public service, because I believe the thousands and thousands of people that are in the public service do really good work. And when things like this happen, it really impacts that whole trust within our public service, who we rely on on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in getting that work done. So <clears throat> perhaps I'll start by, uh, by going back to the situation in 2020. Uh, and Ms. Reza, perhaps you can help us uh, in understanding what was going on in procurement um, in 2020 and how did it differ from 2019? Thank you very much for the question. Um, it differed pretty significantly and radically. We doubled the contract value that we did in the year with the same amount of staff and we did it in a in a position where, you know, in, in mid-March, we were negotiating services and all of a sudden we were responsible for buying PPE for Canada, not just for, at the federal level, but to help the provinces and territories. And buying PPE for Canada, that was not for the faint of heart. I was front and center in that, working night and day with many other people who were working night and day, trying to build a supply chain that was able to pivot around the world to be able to support the needs of Canadians, of hospitals. I mean, it was pretty incredibly intense. And every department coming trying to seek um, the authorities they needed to be able to deliver critical services to Canadians. Add in vaccine procurement in a globally competitive environment. Add in trying to have call centers, uh, getting uh, freezers to keep vaccines, trying to work with a workforce that was exhausted, sick, trying to deliver services for Canadian society. It was a pretty uh, intense period of time where a tremendous amount of work went on. And I think that I heard in your question, that, you know, the work that the public service is doing, this current situation that we're facing in procurement is, is shattering. And I think that, you know, I've heard uh, both the AG and the uh, Controller General of Canada caution that not more rules are required. But as you heard my colleague indicate, we've already started to put in new rules. And we've started to enforce and do what we can to increase our due diligence. So it's going to be a very difficult way forward based on a, a year or two years of pandemic readiness in terms of PPE vents. Uh, many different commodities that had to be built and a supply chain created where there was none before. So it's, it's certainly a very difficult period. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, taxpayer dollars mean a lot. They mean a lot to me. They mean a lot to my colleagues, to every single member in this house and, and how we use them. Now, as you're going forward in, in, fixing a lot of these mistakes that have happened on this specific uh, contracting. Is there a way to get taxpayer dollars back? When uh, Are you able to do something about it? Thank you very much for the question. The Governor of Canada has different uh, levers that it can use for restitution. Uh, we are in the process of, we are in midst consultation with our legal services to see what we can do across an um, array of measures. Thank you. Thank you. And can you also kind of compare? So, I mean, during COVID, you spoke about this. There were so many contracts going on, whether it was for N95 masks or um, vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. Did we see similar procurement um, 
practices in, in all of these other contract negotiations as well? Thank you very much for the question. No, we did not. And I want to add something that I think is also uh, very pertinent to the conversation. Because in 2020, it was such a, a difficult, turbulent time where so many things were happening, we actually took an unprecedented uh, measure of sending out a conflict of interest form to all procurement officers and all senior officials at the, at the PSPC, asking them if they had any conflicts of interest with the firms that we were doing business with. We did that, I think, two or three times in 2020. And we have a thousand um, COIs on record. And we actually asked them because at that time, Dalian, GC Strategies, and Coradix were in the mix of companies that we were doing business with for this CBSA um, application. And we received nil responses. Thank you very much. Suivant, c'est Monsieur le Mire Ancard pour deux minutes, 30 secondes. Mr. Lemire, two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. How is it that the department in charge of procurement wasn't aware of contracts awarded by various departments that it's supposed to offer advice to? There's something that fascinates me here. How is it the GC strategies could rack up contracts at the same time as having only two people under their employ? Is there a sense of panic in the department when it comes to awarding those contracts without a proper verification process of the whole broad uh, uh, issue? That's a very interesting question. As I said earlier, there's only a small number of contracts of contracts that are awarded on this basis. Most contracts are awarded by departments and uh, themselves and the onus is on them to engage in proactive disclosure. And that is a responsibility under the Treasury Board uh, Secretariat's directives. Well, it's important to, for GC Strategies to remember, for us to remember, this isn't a company that came out of nowhere. It had qualified and was pre-qualified under the supply arrangements and had met a certain number of criteria in terms of its financial capacity, it's a previous experience. So they didn't just come out of the blue uh, or out of left field. They had a history, a track record of previous contracts. So I, I'm not trying to defend the company, but I just want to put all of this in context, in the proper context. So I just wanted to bring that point to the table concerning GC strategies. Well, given the context, well, ArriveCan had to be developed. How is it the big, the big players uh, uh, in IT didn't submit, didn't bid in this process. How is that possible? Response. Well, I'd like to refer back to a comment I made early in the meeting. The CBSA identified only one single supplier that had the capacity to help them. They had the requisite experience to prepare a new app of this kind. And the second point I'd like to make is this. There's competitive procurement and non-competitive procurement. There were other suppliers that uh, reported an interest, but they decided not to bid. Thank you. Uh, Suivan, next up is MP Idlout. You have the floor again for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Deputy Minister's response earlier indicates to me that she has received guidance about the importance of recon reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, including in procurement. So my next questions will be to seek whether that reaches measures in subcontracting. Uh, Mr. Yao has claimed to be very busy finding vendors in order to fulfill the contract he received. So my first question is, what is the process to ensure benefits are still delivered to Indigenous peoples when contracts are awarded to Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs that intend to subcontract those services? Thank you very much. I'm going to ask my head of procurement to respond. 
Thank you very much for the question, Mr. President. I would say that an excellent question that is being raised, uh, this question would have unfortunately to be directed to Injust Service Canada. Uh, they're the one basically responsible to establish the criteria in terms of, I know that there's a 51% ownership requirement uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that uh, there, there are uh, economic uh, implication for the communities. This is something also that is within their purview. So I wouldn't want to comment on their behalf. What kind of arrangement do you have with Indigenous Services, uh, in Indigenous Services Canada, to make sure that uh, those measures are being followed? Thank you for the question, Mr. President. So we, Mr. Chair, we are in touch with uh, with them. I know that they're actively looking into this. Uh, they're looking at the Indigenous Business Directory. Uh, maybe they're they're reviewing some of the some of the rules. So I know that uh, they're basically quite seized with uh, with the question these days. And if I could add, we also do Indigenous benefit um, reports in various fields. So, for example, here uh, on uh, Parliament Hill for the construction we're doing, we have uh, a report on this area as well as in defence procurement. So we try to capture it in various elements and make it accessible and make it known what our expectations are. Thank you. Uh, probably my last question. Could you provide the details of how Dillian followed the process to ensure that some contracts were awarded to other Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs? Thank you very much. We'll take that contract. Uh, we'll take that question and provide it to the Indigenous Services Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, going now to MP Barrett, you have the floor for five minutes. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I want to pick up where we were before. Uh, 635, what was the term that you used for them? Uh, Deputy Minister? Companies, they're, they're, they're the uh, professional services providers. TV. Professional services providers. Okay. So these 635 companies are not executing on the actual work, as you detailed in, in the uh, um, questions from my colleague. Uh, they're Middlemen, so they're uh, they're they're middlemen. They're they're not executing on it. They're just finding uh, resources and providing them. Um, the Auditor General found that one of them, GC Strategies, wrote an RFP uh, for the government, effectively to the exclusion of anyone else, um, but their own company. Is that common practice? No, it is not. How many other occurrences of that are there in the government of Canada? Thank you for the question. Uh, first, when we saw this in the AG's report, we also immediately picked up the phone to talk to the Auditor General because we were obviously unaware. We have since referred the matter to the RCMP as well. I know that that seems to be the door that goes to, but we take these matters very seriously. When bid material is being prepared, as was discussed yesterday in the committee, there's an attestation that says, have you been involved in this? Because it precludes you from bidding on the work. So there's a lot of bells and whistles that are required. And in terms of your exact question, I'm going to ask Catherine, who has a responsibility in security, to advise us if you have any so, information on data. So I'd, I'd no. like to offer a precision on my question before you respond. 635 companies, the Auditor General looked at one program and found a con one of one of the contractors was doing this how many other companies uh, do you suspect have engaged in this uh, and are you certain that there are no other occurrences uh, of this uh, of this uh, these middlemen writing their own contracts thank you very much for the question we, we can't be certain what we do is we spend time looking at fraud, detection, data mining, and constantly auditing the various elements of it. Catherine? Merci, non, merci pour la question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairperson. So we do have a preventative and detection and early response framework to certain allegations that are brought before us. So as soon as there is an allegation, we look closely to see if there is documentation to support the allegation. Then we conduct an analysis to determine if there's evidence to uh, 
substantiate the allegations. Now, when we, if we arrive at that stage, we then refer the file to the internal investigative branch of the department so that they can move forward with the formal investigation of those allegations that have been laid. Are we, will, if we find that criminal intent or action, we refer this file on to the RCMP. Thank you uh, very much. I will circle back to, to, to that, um, but I, I just want to revisit with you, Deputy Minister. So you've said specifically with respect to this issue on um, the, the RF, the request for proposal being authored by the bid winners, uh, GC Strategies, that, that matter was referred to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police? So, uh, Chair, her mic didn't turn on. The, the Would you repeat the, that? I, I didn't the, miss the that as well. Yeah. Mic didn't it should go on automatically. Yes. Confirm that she said yes. Yes, it has been. Okay. So, um, uh, Ms. Poulin, I, uh, previously you talked about being reasonably suspicious of the conduct of GC strategies that you were gathering evidence. Are there additional matters or, or additional uh, files that you have transferred to the RCMP with respect to uh, to GC strategies. Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairperson. We have a number of reviews and administrative investigations underway. We take all the information that's provided to us seriously by the CBSA, the Auditor General's report, as well as the Ombudsperson's report. So we've analysed all of these files and certain steps of the preliminary investigation are underway to validate the allegations that have been brought to our attention. As soon as we have adequate evidence to substantiate those allegations, and that's part and parcel of our process, then to transfer the information to the RCMP. Have you at this point transferred any information to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as a result of those reviews? Donc, nous avons transféré, uh... We've transferred the same file that the Deputy Minister just alluded to. So we shared our concerns with the RCMP as to the fact that a supplier was working on its own statement of work. Suiva, um, next, it's Ms. Yip. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Reza and your department for your tremendous efforts during the pandemic. Um, the Auditor General looked at contracting for PPE as well as for vaccines. Can you remind us of her findings on the contracts for these two categories? I, I think I might answer that uh, question. In terms of the uh, the vaccines, we, we commented on the fact that uh, the government was able to mobilize and get sufficient vaccines for every Canadian to be vaccinated if they wanted to be vaccinated. Our concern related to um, making sure that there was best value and indeed in a, in a highly competitive environment, we, we signaled that, that it was a challenge for the government. Um, obviously, with respect to the, the earlier audit of uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, we had similar findings that the government had mobilized to, to uh, make sure that the, the PPE needed by Canadians was available. Thank you. Um, Ms. Reza, yesterday GC Strategies had its uh, security certification suspended, which means it's ineligible from bidding on any contracts with security requirements. Why take this step now? Thank you very much for the question. Merci beaucoup pour la question. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chairperson. So as I explained earlier, we take very seriously all allegations that are brought to our attention when it comes to our suppliers and some of their bosses. Now, it's important to understand here that we have to substantiate those allegations with evidence to have adequate evidence that they are not uh, complying with the contract security arrangements. So when we look at the allegations, we determine whether there's enough evidence to establish that one of the directors of GC Strategies was no longer compliant with the contract security program. So the first step in this case was to suspend the uh, director's security clearance. And when that security clearance was indeed suspended, GC Strategies automatically 
fell into non-compliance with the contract security program, and that triggered the suspension of their own security clearance. So um, what is the bar for suspending? Merci beaucoup pour la question, uh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chair. There is no bar per se. Each allegation must be looked at on its own merits to determine whether it is substantiated and if there are substanti is substantiating evidence. So sometimes if there's one allegation, we can confirm it by way of specific evidence. Now, let me now refer to the other security clearance suspension that occurred we were informed of the fact that a senior director of a supplier had two jobs. He was, uh, so this verification was very swift and we got confirmation of this double dipping. And as a, on the basis of that, and given the other evidence in the file, we determined that the director was uh, no longer in compliance with the program and we suspended his security clearance promptly. As far as GC strategy is concerned, there are a number of allegations that were made and the sum total of the allegations that were substantiated resulted in the fact that the senior director fell into non-compliance and his security clearance was suspended as a result. Thank you. Um... A very significant issue that the Auditor General's report identifies is the ter terrible lack of documentation. Um, supporting, as we all know, supporting documents were either not kept with the appropriate file or in some cases uh, not kept at all. PSPC expanded the new electronic procurement system last year. Can you tell us more about the system and whether you believe had it been in use for this project, would it address some of the concerns around the document um, retention. Thank you very much for the question. I, I want to start by saying that uh, this is a uh, recommendation that we also saw in OPPO in terms of the uh, documentation on the PSPC side, what we need to do better. Dominique is going to talk to it in a moment, but I just want to be unequivocal. This is about due diligence and ensuring that we have the right documents on file so that when the auditors come in, Parliament, Canadians, there's a clear thread to the decision making. So we're really going to double down going forward on due diligence. I think uh, you heard my colleague earlier talk about some of the measures we're taking to have greater price substantiation, cost control, uh, decisions, the functions that are being associated with the task authorizations meticulously recorded. But there is an additional wrapper around that, and that is the e-procurement system, taking what has been traditionally paper across the system and putting it into a, uh, a procurement system that's online, digital, that's going to give us a lot of different various elements, including security, audit, and... Yeah, so it was launched in 2018. So <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Port, we're going to have to come back to this. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm well over. I appreciate it. Uh, but there is time remaining for members to pick this up. Uh, again, and I'm sure I'm sure they will. Um, turning now to Ms. Cousy, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President or Mr. Chair. Very much appreciate it. Um, before I get into my questions, I just want to say to Canadians and to all of the Liberal members, members, excuse me, on this committee, the ministers are inexplicably implicated in overseeing these projects. That's what a minister is for, to oversee the spending of taxpayer dollars. That is their job, to oversee all these things. It would be impossible not to implicate the ministers in these projects and in the outcomes that are received or not case not received, this case not received for Canadians. It is, it is impossible to not imply the ministers, to not implicate the ministers here. I want to make that absolutely clear. Team of the Auditor General, um, you did a report on government benefits modernization and found that it was over budget by $3 billion. Is that correct? I don't remember the exact uh, number, but we did find that there was, uh, there was over budget uh, that was happening. Okay. And would it be fair to say that this is the largest IT modernization project program in Canadian history? Would that be an accurate comment? It is certainly a, a large one when, when you consider the fact that it's dealing with CPP, EI, and uh, other major benefit programs for Canadians. 
And would it be fair to say, based upon what we've seen with the uh, creation of a RIVE scam, that this project is largely based on IT outsourcing? I think that's evident from the the way that the the contracts have been have been running. Uh, we identified in the report that there was a heavy reliance on external contracts instead of the public service, and that uh, over time there should have been an analysis of how to uh, move that work to the public service. So then, it would be fair to say that for this project, the largest project in the history of Canadian government, that the Canadian government is using outsourcers such as GC Strategies and others. Would that be a, a safe assumption in this case? Just to be clear on my last answer, I was referring to the uh, the ArriveCan audit. In terms of the uh, the benefits delivery modernization, I think as we as we heard from the chief information officer in December, it is important to rely on external contractors for some work. The real question is making sure that there is a rationale for uh, using external contractors versus the public service and identifying when uh, things should be done by the public service. But essentially, this project, the largest project, the largest IT project in Canadian governmental history is is um, the same process that was used for a rise scam is being used for this project. Would you say that's accurate? I, I don't think I'm in the best place to comment on that. I think uh, perhaps what I, I might turn this over to the deputy minister. Uh, but before I do, I would I would mention that the arrive can uh, application development happened in the context of the pandemic where um, national security uh, exceptions may have been available. I don't believe that the situation is is on all fours with the benefits delivery modernization. No, that's fine, Mr. Hayes. I'll continue with my questioning. So, uh, but would you say it's possible then that the, the uh, benefits modernization that was completed a report was completed by your office where they saw it was a three billion dollar we're not even talking 54 million 60 million but a three billion dollar overrun it's it's safe to say that it could be as a result of the same model that arrive scam is is being based upon would, would there be any truth to that statement at all or would, th would this possibility exist that what we see with arrive scam 60 million minimum could be used for this largest project ever in the history of Canadian government in IT that currently is at a $3 billion overrun. Is that possible? Well, I'm, I'm having a difficult time making, making the connection between the two projects. What I would say is that some of our findings in the ArriveCan audit would be important for, for the departments that are involved in benefit delivery modernization, including the importance of making sure that competitive procurement is used as much as possible, including the fact that uh, documentation for decision making should be clear and concise on the file. Yeah, I don't think it is difficult to make the connection because we have this uh, $50 million, $60 million uh, arrive scam application. Point of I order. Think it's very easy to apply it to just, point of order. Uh, just and I'm one, sure just, Ms. Cousy, I've, I've are stopped the clock. At the prospect Ms. Ms. Cousy, I have a point of order. Runs. I will return the floor you, to Mr. you President. shortly. Um, the, uh, the, the, the witness has uh, been answering the question that we've seen this already from uh, the Conservative members. Uh, witnesses are answering questions clearly and they are uh, re- uh, characterizing and uh, yes. misquoting the uh, officials. This isn't a point Th of order. Thank you, well, um, Ms. Shannon. There was no misquoting. They're engaged in a discussion. Uh, Ms. Cousy, you have the floor. We discuss, um, they cover up. We, we, you, you have the floor for about 20 seconds for your we discuss, closing discuss. remarks, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. So President. I, I, uh, I, I think that it's very evident. Any, any individual knows if you take a sample size of something, you can apply it to a larger uh, subset. Say, for example, polls. You can take a small poll and apply it to a larger subset. Just one thing as an example, and I think that we would find that as well, that the mismanagement that we have seen in ArriveScam could potentially, is potentially, is being used in this larger subset of this largest project in the history of Canadian IT Thank you. Uh, government projects. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much, Mr. President. Thank you, witnesses. Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you. I am going to uh, give my turn over to MP Shanahan because I just have to leave for a ministerial announcement, but I have MP um, 
Ariel has stepped up. So coverage is here. The floor is yours, Brenda, and thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and uh, again, I, I want to take this time to thank the uh, Deputy Minister and the entire procurement team for really stepping up during those early days of the pandemic when uh, we really, uh, the world was in a health crisis uh, never before seen uh, in a hundred years and uh, all hands were on deck to make sure that we first had the um, uh, PPE equipment and remember how desperate people were to obtain uh, that protection equipment, uh, as well as ensuring that we were um, collecting the right information to adequately uh, quarantine uh, people until such time as we got the vaccines and uh, we heard from uh, the uh, Deputy Auditor General how um, uh, those vaccines were obtained and uh, they were distributed across the country and lives were saved. So thank you very much uh, again to the procurement team. Now, I think that it's fair to say that a general common thread to uh, most of the uh, recommendations that we are hearing from the procurement Ombud, uh, ombudsman and the AG uh, when it comes to PSPC is that you play a greater oversight role in contracting by client departments. And uh, this is something that I, I believe your department accepts. And we have heard uh, a testimony that you are so doing. Uh, generally speaking, delegated authorities to other departments and public servants is meant to make the process more efficient and reduce bottlenecks. And we did hear some concerns from the AG yesterday, um, the Auditor General, that uh, she was concerned about um, access uh, by especially smaller uh, suppliers. Uh, and we can think of uh, Indigenous suppliers um, uh, to a system that may then become overregulated. Um, but obviously there needs to be accountability. So I wonder if you can speak a bit from your perspective to find the balance between oversight and efficiency, as both are obviously very important. Thank you very much for the question. I think it's a super relevant question. Uh, I've been working at PSPC since 2016 and all through 2017, 2018, we really focused on how to simplify procurement. And we came to OGO and we uh, were able to be witnesses. We were able to take some great recommendations that were put forward by OGO in terms of how do you debundle the federal procurement system to make it more accessible to Canadian SMEs? Canada uh, has a huge portion of its economy based on SMEs. And so we've spent the last five years looking at supplier diversity, making sure that our procurement practices are, are inclusive, working on figuring out how to reduce barriers, how to make it less burdensome. You've heard probably at nauseum about the e-procurement system, but imagine uh, every time you want to compete, you got to fill in paperwork, you got to show your certifications, your ISO standards, you have to complete. And every time you miss putting in that certification, you're screened out. So by at least having the e-procurement system, we're hoping that that's going to be a level playing field for um, SMEs to have quicker and easier access. But at the same time, I think we are struggling and, and based on, you know, what we've seen here as well on do we have the right strat strategy to debundle procurements? Where are we introducing risk? Where are we introducing complexity? So how do we take all those considerations and create that balance so that we're able to deliver services? We've heard a lot of different reports spoken about recently or cited from the AG. One of the ones that I was reviewing last night was the recent one on um, IT projects. And I think it's the one that uh, was just referred to. But in that context, the fundamental issue for the government of Canada is most of our systems are decades old. They're mm. built in-house. They're not um, paper-based. They have reliances. So how do we move to a digital transformation to be able to deliver services to Canadians? And how do we see SMEs as part of that? So these are the areas that we're grappling with. And while I still have the floor on this, I would also raise to the table's attention is that I believe that procurement is one spoke, but the other spokes are the government's 
uh, HR practices, staffing practices, so we can bring in people quickly with the right skill sets. But fundamentally, as a deputy head, I really focus my attention on project management. I think that's a key piece of the equation that we need to talk about. It's a key part of the financial delegations and how the money is being spent and how things are being prévoyé, planned for, so that when we do procurement processes, they're actually meeting the timelines and that they're they're properly planned. So if you're you're buying something, you're not increasing through amendments the contract value uh, exponentially. So I'll just pause thank, here. Thank you very much. That is the time for Ms. Shanahan. Maintenant, c'est M. Lemire encore une fois. Mr. Lemire, once again, two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much. Ms. Poulain, Ms. Reza, at this stage, should we review the policies and regulations on contracting that uh, favor First Nations? Does this particular situation call into question these contracts awarded to the First Nations? Is this a, a single occurrence or is it uh, playing out in other spheres? Merci pour la question, Monsieur le... Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Chair. Well, our department is following what's uh, being reported in the media and the fallout, and we must uh, underline the fact that this is not our... Uh, top uh, responsibility. We're in contact with the organization that is fully apprised of the situation at hand. These are not changes that can be rushed through either. We need to be careful here. There's an unfortunate event that occurred that has made headlines. But what I can tell you, given that we're not the department responsible for updating the policies themselves for being registered on the list, we ensure that uh, our contracts do comprise as great a component, Indigenous component as possible, and we're proactive in that sense, but it's not exactly within our purview. That said, I can tell you that the department is uh, very much aware of the situation. Well, that's fascinating. If you want to avoid, uh, award uh, uh, contracts to Indigenous companies, and yet it's uh, non-Indigenous people that are do it performing the work, that's not meeting the objective. Question. Now, as far as the CBSA is concerned, they could have excluded other suppliers. When can we get more information in that regard? Was there any uh, criminal intent that you've determined as part of your criminal investigations that should be brought to the attention of the committee at this stage? Response. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairperson. As I mentioned earlier, we have received three reports over the last couple of months from the CBSA and also the conclusions drawn by the Auditor General as well as the Ombudsperson on procurement. So we're going over that information with a fine tooth comb and we're also looking to see if it cor correlates with other information from our internal investigations. We need to substantiate the allegations and see if there's other supporting evidence and then to conduct a comprehensive review of that. Now, once we reach the conclusion that there is criminal content, or uh, we then refer the file over to the RCMP. Now, that said, any allegations uh, regarding the supplier and their own statement of work is something of concern to us. To us. And oftentimes we share that information with the RCMP earlier rather than later. Question, Mr. Sorry to cut you off, Mr. Lemire. Your time has run out. At uh, next up, we have uh, Miss Idloud again. You have the floor for two and a half minutes, please. Um, I'm not entirely convinced by the deputy minister's responses regarding the uniqueness of what happened in COVID-19 um, because there have been other world epidemics, pandemics like uh, re most recently SARS and H1N1. So I think that there have been uh, recommendations that must not have been implemented uh, to allow for such drastic failures by this liberal government uh, in the ARRIVE camp. Uh, secondly, I wanted to mention uh, the continual failure of this liberal government regarding indigenous peoples uh, in terms of contracting as well, because as I said earlier, uh, the Nutrition North program is a major failure 
uh, that's supposed to help alleviate poverty, but the way that it's contracted out is another indication of whether indig meeting indigenous people's needs is actually at the forefront of this liberal government. Uh, I, I point very easily to the fact that Nutrition North is supposed to alleviate poverty, but the Northwest Company has profited $119 million in, in one quarter. And in that same one quarter, they received a $61 million subsidy uh, from the federal government. Uh, I'd like to ask the Auditor General, uh, what policies and procedures are needed to strengthen contracting procedures, especially when it's supposed to benefit or alleviate things like poverty among Indigenous peoples? Thank you for the question. Just before I, I dig into that answer, I would signal that uh, that the member's point about the the pandemic and and previous uh, previous experiences like SARS was uh, indeed a, a matter that we raised in our pandemic preparedness report. We said that there were long-standing known issues that uh, should have been dealt with long before the this pandemic presented itself, and we hope that the government has learned from those lessons. In terms of policies for procurement. Um, to, to make sure that uh, that there, there is a good service for, for Indigenous people and indeed the uh, Nutrition North program. What I would say is that that is a matter that comes down to the departments responsible for those procurements, making sure that the requirements and the services that are needed are clearly articulated in the, in the contract documents, whether they be in the request for proposal or the ultimate contracts that are signed with those organizations. Again, tying this to our Arrive Can work, this is exactly why we made the recommendations that deliverables and uh, and costs be be uh, captured in documentation and included in in uh, the contracts. Thank you very much. That is the time. Uh, turning now to uh, Mr. Genuis, who is our second last uh, questioner. Over to you, and then we have uh, Ms. Shanahan, and that should be a wrap. Mr. Genuis, you have the floor for five. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there are so many different parts to this Arrive Scam scandal. Uh, one of them is is this fundamental fact revealed by the Auditor General's report that the process was rigged, uh, that people who had been predestined by the government to get a contract sat down with government officials to determine the terms of the request for proposals, uh, which they would then bid on. It's a rigging of the process, uh, a predestining of the process. And, and, and we believe in free will, not predestination. We think everyone has an opportunity based on their decisions and actions to access government contracting if the system is working uh, properly. But it's no wonder with this kind of system that outsourcing has increased 60% under these liberals when we have deals that are, that are rigged. Um, my first question to, to Ms. Reza, have those involved in this Arrive Scam rigging been identified and held accountable. Thank you very much. Uh, as we have both indicated, we have referred the matter to uh, the RCMP. Uh, ha have you identified which individuals were involved in this discussion on the government side? Thank you for the question. So based on the information we received, there's some information on suppliers, some on employees. We're completing our analysis to determine whether the action that was taken in uh, the employee's uh, work was uh, a problem or with whether there was an anomaly. And this analysis is being completed. You're, you're, you're saying you're doing work to identify whether or not there was a, a, a problem. The Auditor General's report was was very clear on this. Maybe I'll just go to Mr. Hayes. Uh, have have were you able to identify in the process of your work the individuals that were responsible for this for this bid rigging? And can I ask you as well, are you aware of other instances across government where this practice has occurred? Answering the second question first, uh, there aren't other examples where we have seen that that has happened. However, I think I will say unequivocally it shouldn't happen. Um, there, there shouldn't be contractors involved in writing the requirements for the contracts that they ultimately bid on um, in a competitive process. In terms of the question about the RCMP, we did have a conversation with the RCMP where we identified that 
um, that we had information that they may be interested in. Uh, all of our files contain uh, the the information available from the departments and the, the analysis that we've done. So the RCMP can see from our files exactly who has been involved from our perspective. Okay, so you, you do have on your files indications of which individuals were part of this, this rigging process. Uh, and yet what we're hearing from government officials is that is that they're still they're still investigating. Um, Ms. Reza, do you want do you want to comment on that? Uh, if Mr. Hayes has that information, presumably you do as well. I might just add, we did provide some information to the committee, I, I believe it was on Tuesday, that shows um, some of some of the information about where and how the uh, the company was involved in setting the requirements for the for the contract. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, I'll turn turn. It back sorry, sorry, I, I I am tight for time. Just just in the time I have left, very quickly, Miss Reza, uh, other instances where this r rigging of contracts has occurred. I, I'm not aware of any, but I I'll turn here because we okay. Are, are, can you can you tell us that that hasn't happened in any other cases, or you're just you're just un unsure? Um, Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairperson. So as I mentioned earlier, we have an internal investigatory team. There are a number of files that are referred to that team on a yearly basis. There are many topics of investigation that can be referred to us. I don't think this is the first time that we've heard of the fact that there may have been conduct on the part of a supplier in a particular process. That said... Sorry, again, just because of time, it it it, it seems like you're saying that there are that there are other instances that may be being investigated. Uh, and I think we'll need more information on that. I, Chair, in the time I have left, I want to move a motion that the committee report to the House that it invites the President of the Treasury Board, Anita Anand, to appear for no less than two hours in relation to the ARRIVE uh, scam study, and that this meeting occur within three weeks of this motion being uh, adopted. Uh, having moved the motion, I will now uh, speak to it. Uh, just, just a point of order, hold, Chair. Hold, hold on one, all right, just, just one second. I just want to consult not, yeah. with the, 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 uh, the clerk, Mr. Junior. First, I'll hear the point of order from Ms. Shanahan, please. Yes, Chair, I uh, call again. Uh, we're having this stunt uh, sprung on us uh, by Mr. Not Genius, point of order. and I call for a suspension of this meeting. Please suspend the meeting so that we can discuss well, just, and receive the motion. Yeah, just, just, I'm, yes. Uh, so, so you're, you're, you're reading my mind. I'm just going to consult with the clerk for a second. Just hold on, please. All right, I see hands going up. Ms. Generous, you've not, uh, yes, Ms. Generous, you're back. But first, I'm going to suspend for five minutes. I'm going to give our witnesses a chance to stretch their legs uh, because you're not excused yet, unfortunately. I'm hoping this will go relatively quickly, but you never know with committee. So um, uh, I will suspend for five minutes, then I will come back to Mr. Genuous, and then I will proceed with the speaking list. So this meeting is suspended for five minutes.
Members, uh, back into order. Um, witnesses, you're you're welcome to float around the room as you as you like. I will certainly give you a heads up, uh, and you'll probably be able to hear it as well. You don't need to stick stay affixed to the, the table, but of course, you're welcome to. Um, I have a speaking order. Uh, I'm going to go again, Mr. Genuist, then Miss uh, Khalid, uh, Miss Kuzi, and then Miss Shanahan. Um, Mr. Genuis, you oh, first. First, um, I would like to have you see to change uh, the name of the program in the motion, so it, it is arrive. Can uh, I'm not looking for discussion on this. I would just like your consent to to do that. Any objections? Seeing none, uh, it is arrive. Can in this motion that members are. Debating. Mr. Genuis, back to you. Uh, you're welcome to make your rhetorical flourishes on the floor, but not in the motions that this committee will consider. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. And, and next time I put a RIVE scam in a motion, I will add the appropriate trigger warning uh, at the end of the motion. Uh, I guess at the beginning of the motion would make more sense since Chair, it's a trigger that's warning. That's not point of order. That's uh, not necessary. We can we can have respectful adult conversations. Miss 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 Shanahan, I she understand what a point Miss, of order is. Yeah, <laughs> Miss Shanahan, you're you're down on the on the list, and we will we will get to you, Mr. Genuis. You have the floor. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I I think we we might need a remedial uh, refresher on the standing orders and and which standing orders you can invoke if you disagree with something someone is saying. Um, just a point, point, of, point of clarification that would apply to all parties, I think. Over uh, you, Mr. Uh, uh, absolutely, Chair. Absolutely. Uh, anyways, um, I, I did want to speak to this motion, which is a motion about asking uh, the Minister of the Treasury Board to come uh, before this committee uh, to answer for what happened in the Arrive scam scandal. Uh, we've uh, heard some discussion even at today's meeting about this issue of ministerial accountability. Uh, are ministers accountable and to what extent are ministers accountable for what happens in their government? Now, as far as I can discern, the, the best defense uh, that liberal members can muster of the government's action in the context of the Arrive Scam scandal is to try to convince us that ministers of the Crown do absolutely nothing. Uh, that over four ministers of procurement since this pandemic started, that the ministers of 
procurement. Uh, we're not involved in setting policies, making decisions, giving direction order, as it relates to order, procurement. Chair. Okay, just we heard yesterday from witnesses that ministers don't have anything to do that with procurement. Okay, no, 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 okay, 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 we, Ms. We okay all right, Ms. Ms. Shanahan, Ms. Shanahan, you are down it. on the third. Um, that's that's yeah, Ms. Shannon, you're you down to speak. This is a very valid debate. The the and I'm you're allowed me to speak to it now. The deputy minister has come in today and frankly made the minister sound like he is a passenger in this voyage, uh, not steering the ship. So that is why I think the opposition is raising this, but it is valid. And you're welcome to debate the merits of ministerial accountability in your turn not as a point of order which it is which it is not but you are third on the list i am welcome i always welcome points of order to guide me uh but i ask that there be points of order mr genuous you have the floor again mr speaker this this liberal member is is uh helpfully assisting me in precisely demonstrating the point that i was making uh, she's saying come on now the the, the 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 minister is is not actually involved in making any decisions that have relevance to the procurement process um perhaps the title minister of procurement is is uh purely decorative um mr, mr. speaker uh canadians expect better though Canadians expect ministers to take responsibility for things that happen within their department. Of course, we understand that uh, ministers aren't involved in, in every specific decision that happens within their department, but they're responsible uh, for establishing the culture, setting the policy frameworks, uh, giving broad direction, and certainly insisting on remedial action uh, when things are clearly starting to go off the rails, as was obviously happening in the case of the Arrive Scam scandal for a long time. Uh, we've had four ministers of procurement in the last four years under these liberals. Uh, I, 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 I wonder if they should just formalize the process by designating a potted plant to be the fifth minister. A potted plant could receive briefings still, uh, could be present in the department still, um, but would ostensibly have as much to do with actual procurement uh, as the last four Point of ministers order, have had. Again, uh, I, Chair, I think it's. I would go to language. I would go to language in uh, describing Miss, uh, Miss, other Miss, come on. members Miss, of Miss, Parliament. Miss Shanahan. And it's called delegated authority. Miss, Miss, Miss Shanahan, you'll be welcome to set the Chair, record. On the point of, on that point of order, Chair. Just, just mm -hmm. hold on, Mr. Mr. Genuous. Ms. Shanahan, these, that's not a point of order. You're interrupting. I try to avoid having members interrupt one another. You are, we can, we can sit here all day. No other committee is sitting today. We have infinite parliamentary resources to, to sit here. If you're going to interrupt, you're going to hear more from me, which will take away from your time. Mr. Genuous, if you have a point where I'd like to hear it, if you don't have a point where I'd like to get back to your time, why don't you just go back to your time? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I don't know that there's any history of the term potted plant uh, being found uh, unparliamentary. Uh, so um, I will underline the point that in our system of government, the public expects ministers to take responsibility, not to be specifically involved in the minutia of every small decision but to be responsible for the policy direction, the culture, the frameworks, the rules, and the, the adherence to the norms that the public expects. So if the Liberals' best defense of what happened in the Arrive Scam scandal is to say the ministers don't have anything to do with what happens inside of government, uh, I would submit that that is also a problem, uh, that it is a uh, problem uh, either way. Uh, now, that's to the general point around ministerial uh, accountability. Of course, we need to hear from Minister Anand specifically uh, in reference to an announcement that she made yesterday uh, in reference to her work as president of the Treasury Board uh, and the steps the government says it is taking in this regard. Uh, so uh, I think it's it's very clear in particular in the context of 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 uh, what we heard yesterday, both at committee uh, and uh, and through the media, uh, that hearing from Minister Anand is uh, of particular importance. So this is why this motion was put forward today. Uh, and um, I, uh, I don't doubt that some members will not agree with some aspects of my uh, commentary, uh, but I hope that won't 
uh, get in the way of support for a common sense motion uh, to invite the president of the Treasury Board to appear before this committee uh, and to speak about uh, her work, the work of her department, uh, and uh, announcements and actions that, that she has spoken about. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Genuis. Uh, Ms. Khalid, you have the floor, please. And, and you're on mute. Before I begin, I will I will remind just members the my comments on points of order applies to all members. Uh, Ms. Khalid, Ms. Khalid, you have the floor. Over to you. Oh, my apologies, Chair. I thought Ms. Uh, Ms. Kuzi was first. Well, the the hands went up, and it was a photo finish. So, um, I, in the in the sake of fairness, decided to go. Um, I can move you down one no, if you no, like. I am please if you can. I'd love to yep. hear what Ms. Kuzi has to okay. say. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Kuzi, um, and then Ms. Khalid, then Ms. Shanahan. Ms. Kuzi, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe my colleague, uh, Mr. Genuis, has indicated the reasons for which um, the President of the Treasury Board should be present in front of this committee to account for. Uh, well, not only her announcement yesterday, but uh, the implication, her implication in the oversight of uh, Arrive Can, um, Arrive Scam going forward. Um, but uh, I also would like to get the president of the Treasury Board uh, in front of the committee as well for another matter that was brought up here today by the deputy minister. Uh, as was indicated yesterday, we found out that a an individual who is working with the public service uh, has received um, a, a significant eight million dollars from the Arrive scam scandal, and the deputy minister herself today said that she has seen in her oversight the firing of five employees for failing to disclose conflict of interest. Well, Mr. President of this committee. Uh, you may remember that Life Labs was granted millions of dollars for COVID testing and that the president of the Treasury Board did not disclose this to the Ethics Commissioner. Now, she did disclose other things, but prior to the pandemic, you'll be interested to know, Mr. President, that Life Labs, the company on which the president of the Treasury Board's uh, husband sits on as a, a, a director, only received $150,000 in contracts prior to the pandemic, only three contracts after the pandemic, where I will remind the committee that the current president of the Treasury Board served as the Minister of Procurement during that time, Life Labs received a contract for in this is this is a number, Mr. President, that goes beyond the number we've been discussing uh, here in a ride scam. Sixty-six point three million dollars on June twenty-third. Sorry, Ms. Kuzi, I have a point of order for yep. Ms. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, just questioning the relevance of this. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Yep. Uh, I think uh, off the top, Ms. Kuzi does have wide latitude. Ms. Kuzi, back to you, please. Yeah, thank you. It's very relevant because this we are is calling study for on her. arrive. Ken, That's right. right, and it and Ms. 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 just just study, one sec, Ms. Kuzi. Conflicts of interest. Yeah, thank you very and, much, and, Mr. President. Uh, uh, sorry, Ms. Kuzi. I, I, it's not my intent to 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 cut you off, and I will let you you finish up. I just wanted to. We are now actually debating uh, the the motion before us. Um, so it's it's and and the Treasury Board President, Ms. Kuzi, you have the last words. I don't know if you wanted to if you want it back again, or if I should, if I should move on. Sure, no, I would like to continue. Thank you. Uh, I am providing another compelling reason that we need the president of the Treasury Board uh, in front of point this, of order, this uh, committee. Oh, it seems to me, Mr. President, that they are trying to um, interrupt yes, me. Let me I'll, I'll, hear, I'll hear the point uh, of so Ms. Ms. Khalid, you, 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 okay, you are next. Go ahead, please, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, I was just wondering if you wanted to excuse any witnesses that are in the room at this point, if that's okay. I, I know that we've gone over time, but I uh, just wanted to make sure that they were not sitting well, around. Well, um, um, Ms. Khalid, you have the last spot, so I will, I, I'm ready to excuse them uh, if, if you like. It is up. I, I can turn to government members or you in particular. I, would you like? Would you like me to excuse the witnesses? I think it would probably be for best for us to uh, to okay. excuse the witnesses. I don't want to keep them waiting. Very good, uh, 
Miss Reza, Mr. Hayes, and your team, thank you for coming in today. I appreciate it, and uh, I too am pleased you are being excused so you uh, can get on with your day. Thank you very much. We'll see you all again. Uh, Ms. Cousy, I, again, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think it's unfortunate that they're being excused because I think actually they would be interested and appreciative that I am actually bringing forward another rationale for the appearance of the president of the Treasury Board that is related to the action that they indicated uh, that they took today on behalf of the information we found out this week about um, Dalian. So as I was saying, uh, the, the, the president of the Treasury Board did not disclose to the Ethics Commissioner that her husband was a director on Life Labs. And as I mentioned previously as well, prior to the pandemic, only $150,000 in contracts. Yet during the pandemic, um, as I was indicating um, before I was interrupted, on June 23rd of 2020, $66.3 million was awarded to Life Labs. But it did not stop there, Mr. President. On August 20th, we saw an additional $1.9 million being awarded to Life Labs. And I say to all Canadians, and I would have said to the witnesses, were they still there, is it not accurate that the president of the Treasury Board, the individuals who oversees the public servants, who is supposed to be a leader, should set the standard, should be held to the same standard, to the same uh, ethical code that this deputy minister with, that we just did, dismissed uh, was so proud to indicate that she held five members to. So I think this is another very compelling reason, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, that we have the president of the Treasury Board. In addition to the oversight, which, as I said previously, of ministers, which is, which is inextricably connected to the outcomes, to the results, where we determine that Canadians did not receive value for money. This is another compelling piece of information, another compelling piece of infinite, er, er, um, evidence, excuse me, as presented by the deputy minister here today in her actions, that also the president of the Treasury Board should be held to. So with that, uh, Mr. President, I will conclude and I would just encourage all committee members to uh, support this, this motion for transparency, not only for the work that is done and the, and the value of tax dollars for Canadians, but also to ensure that these ministers who are inextricably tied to their outcomes are also held accountable to the highest of standards. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Khalid, over to you now, please. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I uh, appreciate uh, you and, and the time that we have to talk about this very important issue. First and foremost, I, I just want to be very clear. I have no issues with any minister coming before this committee to answer questions. I have no issues with holding members of our government, including bureaucracy, to account for what has happened here. What I am concerned about is efficiency. It's about how are we, just as, as we, you know, like the conservatives have really gone down this, this massive uh, fishing expedition. Unfortunately, they haven't caught any fish so far, um, but I'm, I'm wondering what is We caught is one the that's about $60 million in size. Miss, miss, Mr. Barrett, would you like to be added to the speaking list? Mr. Barrett, would you like to be added to the speaking list? Back to you, Miss 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 Khalid. It's happening. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Chair. And uh, to Mr. Barrett, uh, there is no fish that has been caught here. As many as thousands and thousands of hours that you guys have spent in trying to find something here that is passing your sniff test, and the fact that you keep on calling so many committee meetings on this tells me that you haven't really found anything. I think what we have found and what we all of us, all parliamentarians agree on is that something happened here with the Arrive Can app that we need to make sure that bureaucrats are held responsible, that we want to make sure that the money that was paid out to these middle management folks is brought back into, uh, into our government, and that Canadians have accountability for how their tax dollars are spent. What we are not finding here, regardless of all of your countless efforts, is that this was a ministerial sign-off, that, that the prime minister, for some reason, signed off on this. That is not what has happened here. And we've spent, what is it, 6,000 hours on this so far? 
well, let's talk about not finding anything for 6,000 hours and what is one or two more hours of the Treasury Board president going to do to come in to say, all right, let me add to the 6,000 uh, 6, hour tally and millions of dollars of taxpayers so the conservatives can go sniffing and trying to find something and they haven't found anything. What I would appreciate is if we have public officials coming in to talk about what the next steps are, to talk about how we can get our taxpayer dollars back, to talk about how we can fix the process here. Can we not make everything political? I, I would really appreciate if, if we're not just, you know, trying to, to find those cheap political wins in every single thing that the conservatives are doing, let's actually do something productive. That's what the purpose of the Public Accounts Committee is, Chair. And I really appreciate all of your efforts in making sure that we are trying to, to, to do our very best to hear from all the witnesses. But reality is, we still don't have a game plan. We've had so many meetings here in this committee. We still don't have a game plan as to what our next steps are within, within this committee. We can call a million and one witnesses, but and until and unless we as a committee decide, okay, this is how we are going to move forward. These are the recommendations that we are going to provide to our government. This is, is what we need to do to make sure that something like this does not happen again. Then why are we going down a wild goose chase? And again, I reiterate, I have no problems with any minister appearing before the committee. I think that it is ineffective. It is a waste of taxpayer dollars. It is a waste of all of the, the amazing people that are in the room right now making sure that this meeting happens. It is, it's unfortunate. And, and I, I, I would hope that my colleagues would, would agree with me on this. And I know that uh, my conservative colleagues are still going to go down this path of a of a witch hunt uh, and try to find something uh, that uh, that that they can they can just take and and run with. But um, but at this point, I I think perhaps the best thing that we can do is rather than having the minister come in, it would be to bring in um, the officials of the TBS back to talk about how we are going to to move forward on this, how we are going to hold to account and make sure that this does not happen again in the future. So um, I would then move that amendment to say that uh, we remove, um, or we change the president of the treasury board to say, invite back officials from TVS. Just one sec. Uh, Ms. Khalid, I'm, I'm going to rule that that uh, amendment is out of order because it changes the fundamental nature of the motion. You're welcome to bring that back forward. Uh, I'm so sorry, Chair. I would love some clarification on why you think that's out of order. I mean, we don't, I, like I said in, in my remarks, we still don't have a work plan. We have no idea where we're going with this. We keep having meeting after meeting after meeting, not just in public accounts, but in so many other committees across uh, across Parliament. So I don't know how you would rule this out of order if we don't even know what the purpose of, of all of this is at the end of the day. Are we trying to just find something to link to ministers, to to link to, to give political scoring points to, to our conservative colleagues? Or are we trying to get to the bottom of this? And if we are trying to get to the bottom of this, to find next steps, to provide solid recommendations, then how is this out of order? Uh, it it fundamentally changes the 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 motion. You're welcome to bring so it forward, Miss Miss Khalid. I I I allow you to speak. Uh, please please uh, return the, the courtesy. You're Apologies welcome to your your you're welcome to bring it back if you want officials from uh, any department to either appear or or come back. This is about uh, this is about calling a minister of the crown. To appear before this uh, this this committee, so I'm ruling uh, your amendment out of order. You still have the floor, and I have two other speakers. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Before we continue on, uh, I would like to challenge the chair's decision. All right. 
not even a regular member of this committee. What is it you're thinking about that? Love it. So uh, I will turn things over the, to the clerk to uh, call a vote. Uh, and if you could just again, just uh, f to refresh everyone, uh, the amendment that's being made. Who's voting on behalf of the Bloc Quebecois? Mr. Lemire, are you still with us? Good. Okie doke. Actually, Mr. If, uh, just, just to move things along, Ms. Ms. Killeed, could you repeat perhaps in the meantime, um, your amendment is to... Uh, thank you very much, Chair. My amendment is to change the wording, the President of the Treasury Board, to saying to invite back TBS, uh, uh, to, sorry, to invite back officials from the Treasury Board Secretariat. Thank you very much. We have the, the clerk will now call the roll call on that. Over to you, please. Shall the chair's decision be sustained? Mr. Van Bynen. No. Mr. Pavlosky. No. Ms. Khalid. No. Ms. Shanahan. No. Ms. Yip. No. Mr. Genuous. Yes. Mr. Barrett. Yes. Ms. Cousy. Yes. Monsieur Lemire. Oui. Ms. Idlo. Yes. Five yes. Very good. Ms. Khalid, you still have the uh, the floor. Well, I think my vote is to sustain my ruling, obviously. Um, Ms. Khalid, you have the floor. The motion stands as, as presented by Mr. Genuist, with the exception we've corrected it to arrive, can. Ms. Khalid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I uh, appreciate that. And again, I am a little disappointed that we don't have a, a clear pathway forward. I mean, w what are we doing here? We're spending so many taxpayer dollars in finding resources and in, 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 in what's the objective here? I mean, to me, in this committee, the objective is for us to find clear cut recommendations in what the Auditor General's report was on Arrive Can to take what she wrote in consideration and to find a way for us with all of the, the witnesses that we have had to put together some solid recommendations and say, hey, this is what needs to happen going forward to make sure that, that things like this do not happen again. This is what needs to happen to make sure that we are continuing to build the trust of, of Canadians in our democratic institutions. This is what needs to happen to make sure that we are able to bring back the, the money that was spent on this, this is what needs to happen to make sure that we find our fair value for the money that is spent going forward. And the fact that we don't have any of that and we keep on calling witnesses. I remember in December, I think it was December 12th, when all of us in this committee, well, the permanent members of this committee, I don't think any of whom are here today, um, but we spent over an hour working together to find out how we could find a, a, a consensus, how we could build that consensus and talk about accountability, talk about how we are going to move forward together specifically on this issue. And the fact that since then to now, we haven't been able to to find a pathway forwards, to find the next steps is, is disappointing to me. And for us to keep on calling witnesses that have literally nothing to add to what has already been said is, is disappointing to me as well. We have heard again 
and again and again from every single department on this that there was no ministerial sign off on this, that ministers were not involved. This was a middle management issue. There are RCMP investigations happening. What is the role of our committee then if all we're going to do is just try to find linkages between political uh, work and, and with what has egregiously happened here? We can't keep doing that, Chair, and I, I would submit to you that I would ask you to perhaps reconsider that the best way forward for us here is not to try to find, uh, you know, like that, that red herring or whatever it is that the conservatives are looking for, but to, to bring it back to, to reasonable decision making as to what the next steps are. How are we going to fix our process? That is the role of what our committee is and and should be doing not to to go down these fishing expeditions so i i would again submit to you chair that i think that it is best that we bring in tbs officials to talk about those next steps rather than a minister who really as we've heard time and time and time again had nothing to do with this at all i'll, I'll stop there chair and uh, hopefully we'll come back to it in a, at a later time thank you very much miss shanahan you have the floor Thank you very much, Chair, and I too must echo uh, the uh, words of my uh, colleague uh, in that uh, the the uh, what we're on six, seven, eight, nine meetings that we've had on this issue, and consistently we have heard from the Auditor General's team as well as the officials from numerous uh, departments that indeed. Uh, in the um, uh, exercise of procurement, not only is it uh, advisable not to have political interference, indeed it is, it is part of the standards of professional practice and uh, the, um, in keeping with this separation of the machinery of government, which must continue regardless of who the government is uh, in uh, power, and the political side, which rightfully so, uh, is uh, presenting uh, the uh, kind of vision and uh, policy and way forward, new legislation and so on, that needs to be put forward. Uh, to uh, to ensure that uh, Canadians have a, a better better quality of life, and so that we can enjoy the standards that, in fact, Canada enjoys um, on so many levels, uh, and uh, and namely in a time of of, of one of the greatest crises uh, that we had in the last hundred years, a global pandemic, that this professional public service was able to procure the kind of protective equipment, the kind of um, uh, administrative and management processes that were needed to protect Canadians until vaccines were uh, developed and obtained again by this professional team. And I'm going to wager that none of us here around the table would have been able to do the same work. Chair, would you agree with me? Would you like to have been in that seat, trying to, trying to get uh, uh, PPE and trying to get uh, uh, people to uh, develop a, an application and trying to find um, trying to develop vaccines? No, we are politicians, we have a role, we represent our constituencies, but we are not there to run the machinery of government. That rightfully so is separate from the political arm, but to hear my conservative colleagues speak, uh, you know, the political uh, arm should be uh, dipping its fingers into every pie. And I think we know what that would mean. And, and uh, We've all uh, traveled enough and uh, have seen other regimes uh, in other countries to know what that means. That means favoritism and uh, corruption uh, and, um, and certainly uh, at, at the most benign an inefficiency and ineffectual uh, government. And so uh, it is 
really only in, in this issue, which we are all gripped with, the fact that there was inappropriate contracting, that there were bad actors that were taking advantage, and that is what is horrific in this case, to think that there, you know, for all of the public servants that were working above and beyond the call of duty during a very, very difficult time, that there were some bad actors that were taking advantage of that crisis to line their own pockets. We are gripped with that, and that is the reason why I have confidence, and I would think that everyone here around the table would have confidence that the investigations that are being conducted right now, not just internally, not just by the Auditor General, but also by the RCMP, will get to the truth of the matter and that those who are responsible will be held to account. And that is how we can ensure that our public service can continue to operate with integrity, not by picking and choosing who we want to blame and who we want to uh, throw in jail or whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, showboating uh, that uh, some politicians uh, want to do. So when we come back to, to this motion, my preference definitely would be to invite back ministry officials, deputy ministers and so on, which is why again, chair, we had to pass a motion here earlier in the week and I'm glad for the support that we did have uh, from uh, the NDP uh, to invite deputy ministers to this, uh, uh, to uh, these hearings because we were not consulted at all about the um, number of uh, meetings. We had an uh, original motion that talked about two meetings, but we were not consulted about holding further meetings and about who those witnesses would be and how they were chosen and for the length of time and when when uh, th those meetings were would occur. And so it has uh, really been extremely frustrating for the members here who really do wanna get to the bottom of what transpired and to be able to produce a report out of this study that will actually be useful for uh, officials going forward to, and parliamentarians for that matter, uh, to uh, be able to uh, continue to uh, uh, have confidence that, that that oversight function uh, be uh, overhauled uh, and upheld. And we heard testimony to that effect. But as we have done in the past, we will ask for follow-up. We have asked for action plans. That's something that actually, uh, uh, I think it was uh, myself and the NDP member at the time in the 42nd parliament, we asked for action plans to be submitted to the uh, public accounts so that we had assurance that our recommendations were indeed being followed up on uh, ours and the auditor generals. And I'm not sure, and, and, and you know, I appreciate our regular member from the NDP, Monsieur Desjardins cannot be with us during this time. And, and I do want to extend my sympathies to him and his family. I understand he's going through a difficult time right now. So we've had different members from the NDP here, and I'm not sure that um, they realized yesterday in passing the um, other last minute motion by uh, Mr. Genuis uh, yesterday that uh, they were actually uh, putting a target on the back of any and all public servants who may or may not be legitimately carrying out um, uh, other um, uh, other contracts for the federal government. I mean, I'm not an expert in this field, but you know, there's whenever we try to make a one rule fits all, there's always a number of very 
uh, viable and understandable exceptions to that. But, uh, you know, Mr. Genuis was going through for that hit and, uh, and trying to uh, actually in having that reported to the House to use up time in the House of Commons with these, uh, and I believe that's that's where there's like over 6,000 hours and over 200 reports that are on notice right now that can be um, debated on a concurrent mode. That's basically, Chair, when there's a report that has been produced out of a committee, everybody agreed the report has been tabled, and all of a sudden we wanna have three hours of uh, extended debate uh, essentially a filibuster on uh, the um, on the uh, report in the House of Commons. Why? To waste the House of Commons time. And we know that we have important legislation, in fact, the farmer care legislation that I'm so pleased that we were able to work with uh, the uh, NDP uh, and uh, you know, to put forward this uh, pharma care legislation as a member in Quebec, I'm well aware of how um, uh, important and uh, life-changing having access to uh, prescription drugs is. And now that we're, we'll be able to extend that across the country, but will we? Because we've got 6,000 hours projected of concurrent waste the House of Commons time uh, motions uh, on notice by the Conservative government. And so I uh, would ask um, for all members here to consider, uh, let, you know, if we really want to have the minister here, why don't we just invite her? I mean, we have had ministers here before. We can just invite her. That's that's all right, you know. That's something that this uh, this committee has done, and uh, it is um, uh, something where uh, you know we've always been respectful uh, of uh, the fact that ministers have many time constraints, and and I think that it's it's um, behooves us to. Uh, from this committee to have a, um, an, a, a, a motion that uh, shows that respect. Uh, and again, if we were discussing this as we usually do in committee, uh, it could be in camera, it could be in public, but together as a committee during committee business, we could have come to a reasonable uh, uh, invitation uh, to, the, uh, to the minister um, but no, here we are, we're over time, people have other things to do, but uh, this, is, this is what uh, Mr. Genuis decided uh, was the uh, ideal time uh, to pull this done. And so I move the following amendment that the text that this meeting occur within three weeks of this motion being adopted be deleted from the motion. Thank you. Uh, that is certainly in order. We're now debating the amendment to remove the three weeks. Um, so just, I'm gonna confer with the chair for a second. Pardon me, I'm the chair. I'm gonna confer with the clerk one second. Very good. Uh, so we, we're now going to debate the amendment to this motion to remove within three weeks. Um, Miss uh, Illut, would you like to speak to this, or would you would you like me to just hold you till we come back to the main motion? The, the floor is yours if you'd like to. No, I'd like to speak later. Okay, thank you, Miss Yip. Do you want to speak to this amendment, or would you like to have me hold your name and I will come back to it um, once this amendment is addressed um uh yes i can speak to this okay um uh we should uh, so can we can we put this to a vote mm -hmm. speaking to it yes are you done 
Yeah, good. Let's just put it to a vote. Miss, I, oh, I, I have to go through the the the, the, the speaking. Um, Miss Khalid, your hand was up, but then it came down. Do you want to speak to this amendment, or shall we proceed to a vote to remove within three weeks? I think it'll pass unanimously, Chair. I think it might. Not hearing from Miss Khalid. Um, clerk, call a vote on this, please. Shall the amendment proposed by Ms. Shanahan carry? Mr. Van Bynum. Mr. Van Bynum, you're on mute. Sorry. Yes. I was on mute in favor. In favor. Thank you. Mr. Pavlovsky. Four. Ms. Khalid. You're on mute, Miss Miss Khalid. Miss Khalid. Your call. You're you're on mute, Miss Khalid. And I'll just in the meantime, we're voting on an amendment uh, put forward by Miss Shanahan. I My suspect, apologies, Chair. Yeah. Uh, was having a hard time finding the uh, the vote button. I vote yes. Thank you. And if I could ask you, just to put your headset on if you speak again. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Shanahan. Yes. Ms. Yip. Yes. Ms. Block. I'm seeing a, a nay vote from Ms. Block on the camera, which is acceptable. Ms. Mr. Block Barrett? votes nay. Ms. Cousy. Against. Monsieur Lemire. Contre. Ms. Zidlow. Acapuma against. Five yeas, five nays. Very good. Um, Ms. Shanahan, I'm afraid your amendment is uh, defeated. I'm now, I'm obviously voting, um, uh, and I'm now returning to the speaking list. Uh, Ms. Idlout, you have the floor uh, on the motion that is that was presented to us. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is a pleasure to um, represent the NDP. Uh, and I share the sentiments that were shared about my colleague, um, Blake Desjardins. Uh, I do wish him well during his time of grief. Um, I have complete faith in our whole party and what we've heard and the advice give us, given to us by our staff. So when I'm sharing my feedback, uh, it is because of what I'm what I've heard, and um, unfortunately, what I'm hearing uh, during this debate at committee is a lot of partisanship. When we should be demanding accountability, um, what I've heard from the witnesses, from the officials. And I appreciate uh, that it was based on a new motion regarding this study uh, is that the officials were not able to answer my questions and inviting them back will mean that even if I repeat those questions to those same officials, they will not be answered. I understand that there were officials from the Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, I'm I'm. I'm pretty sure that if I ask those officials those same questions, they would not give the same information that Canadians deserve. And the reason I say what Canadians deserve, the original intent of the Arrive Can uh, was supposed to be about $80,000. And to hear that over time, 55 million at the very minimum was spent to have this this app operate uh, so-called for the protection of Canadians health is completely unacceptable. Um, it was only recently that I learned that uh, the recipients of this contract claim to have indigenous identity and use that uh, in this contract. So there are still a lot of unanswered questions. And in when I asked my questions 
it, instead of the officials responding or accepting responsibility, diverted those that information to be answered by another department. And I think that given the huge amount of losses that this program costed deserve the scrutiny that it's received. Uh, I'm not convinced by other interventions that we've been told how many hours have been spent on this, uh, especially when there are still lingering questions about the colossal failure of what has happened. And we need to make sure that uh, the officials aren't the final stop in seeking answers. We do need to hear from the president of the treasury board because it is the president that can give us the bigger picture that we're looking for and where those um, miscommunications costed Canadians so many millions of dollars. I need to say this again, Nunavut are suffering. Uh, the, the level of poverty that exists in Nunavut and for Nunavut to continue to be ignored, uh, for Nunavut to continue have to, to lose to profits to CEOs is completely unacceptable. We need accountability, we need answers. And because of that, I, I support this motion to get those answers from the president of the treasury board. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna to go to Ms. Yip next and then Ms. Shanahan, uh, because Ms. Ms. Yip was on the roll call earlier. If, if you two would like to swap, you're welcome to do that. But Ms. Yip, you have the floor. Okay, and I'm seeing agreement from Ms. Shanahan. Ms. Yip, over to you, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with uh, my colleagues on my side uh, that um, the minister has already been invited to government operations on the same issue. So I don't feel that there's really a need to um, repeat the invitation here and that it just ties up more time, more resources. Uh, we have just on this public accounts committee, we have so many outstanding reports to review. In fact, uh, we've barely moved on reports, on the completion of reports uh, that we were looking at last year. And uh, we certainly had many, many meetings on ArriveCan. And uh, now the, the Auditor General is about to table new reports, and yet we haven't even completed the work that we have set out to do last year. So um, I feel that um, it's also been uh, clear that uh, the, that, um, um, I, um, referring to the report to the House, um, part. This is a political tactic by the Conservatives uh, to clog up the House and, um, and to waste time and resources and to stop us from um, passing legislation that supports Canadians, such as pharmacare. And I, I really don't think that's right to take all this time away. So um, uh, I just uh, like to propose um, an amendment to remove the report to the House. Thank you. Uh, again, Ms. Yiff, I'm going to rule it out of order because that fundamentally changes the nature of the motion to, uh, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to remove that out of order. You're welcome, of course, to vote against it, which is effectively what your amendment is is doing. Um, I, still, don't, I don't, yeah. Sorry, I don't. I don't believe that it's out of, out of order. I'm. I'm going to challenge that. All right. Um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll call. On my decision. <clears throat> Just 
give us a second. Shall the decision of the chair be sustained? Mr. Van Bynen? No. Mr. Povolowski? No. Ms. Kellyan? It's a, it's a no for me. Ms. Shanahan? No. Ms. Yip? No. Ms. Block? Ms. Block is signaling a yes. I record her vote as a yes. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Ms. Cousy? Yes. Monsieur Lemire? En favor. Ms. Edlow? En retournant, yes. Five yeas, five nays. The decision of the chair is sustained. Ms. Ship, you still have the floor. Or you can uh, turn to your colleague, Ms. Shanahan. Just, I just feel that we are, I just wanna, I guess I can't go back to it, but I just feel that I wanna say that we are just removing something. We're not causing the motion to be out of scope. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shanahan, you have the floor. Yeah, I, Actually, I just, have to continue. Just one, uh, Ms. Ms. Clay, you had had your hand up some time ago, and and it's not up now. I just want to confirm if if you're if you're speaking after Ms. Shanahan, or if you if you'd like to speak at all, but you'll have to wait your turn. Of course, I I, I love speaking, Chair, <laughs> yes. and I uh, will continue to <laughs> to speak as all my constituents uh, send me to Ottawa for. Uh, so yes, I do reserve the rights to to speak. Very good. After Ms. Shanahan, you'll be up after Ms. Shanahan. Ms. Shanahan, you have the floor. Thank you. Chair, um, I would actually like uh, to have some clarification uh, uh, on uh, your ruling, on your decision to call that um, Ms. Yip's amendment out of scope, because it is simply deleting uh, text from the, um, from the motion. It is not taking away at all from uh, the uh, invitation to have the minister come before this committee. Uh, I think it is entirely within the scope. And um, so for future reference, I would like to have that um, clarification from the from the clerk. Well, this is this. Um, well, the, the clerk will, will tell you what she just told me. It has been decided by this committee. The debate is back to the motion. You have the floor, Ms. Shanahan. Uh, that's very unfortunate uh, that we were not able to discuss this further because, again, uh, the practice of this committee has been to.
yeah, ideal time. I move the following amendment that the text that this meeting occur within three weeks of this motion being adopted be deleted from the motion. Thank you. Uh, that is certainly in order. We're now debating the amendment to remove the three weeks. Um, so just I'm going to confer with the chair for a second. Pardon me. I'm the chair. I'm going to confer with the clerk one second. Very good. Uh, so we, we're now going to debate the amendment to this motion to remove within three weeks. Um, Miss uh, Illut, would you like to speak to this, or would you would you like me to just hold you till we come back to the main mo motion? The, the floor is yours if you'd like to. No, I'd like to speak later. Okay, thank you, Miss Yip. Do you want to speak to this amendment, or would you like to have me hold your name and I will come back to it um, once this amendment is addressed um uh yes i can speak to this okay um uh we should uh, so can we can we put this to a vote mm -hmm. speaking to it yes are you done yeah good let's just put it to a vote miss i oh, I, I have to go through the 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 this the speaking um miss khalid your hand was up but then it came down do you want to speak to this amendment or shall we proceed to a vote to remove within three weeks. I think it'll pass unanimously, Chair. I think it might. Not hearing from Ms. Khalid. Um, clerk, call the vote on this, please. Through. Shall the amendment proposed by Ms. Shanahan carry? Mr. Van Bynum. Mr. Van Bynum, you're on mute. Sorry, yes. I was on mute in favor. In favor, thank Mr. you. Mr. Pawlowski. Four. Ms. Khalid. You're on mute, Miss Miss Khalid. Miss Khalid. Your call in your you're on mute, Miss Khalid. And I'll just in the meantime, we're voting on an amendment uh put forward by Miss Shanahan. I My suspect, apologies, Chair. Yeah. Uh was having a hard time finding the uh the vote button. I vote yes. Thank you. And if I could ask you just to put your headset on if you speak again. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Shanahan. Yes. Ms. Yip. Yes. Ms. Block. I'm seeing a, a nay vote from Ms. Block on the camera, which is acceptable. Ms. Mr. Block Barrett? votes nay. Ms. Cousy. Against. Monsieur Lemire. Contre. Ms. Edlow. A cartonat against. Five yeas, five nays. Very good. Um, Ms. Shanahan, I'm afraid your amendment is uh, defeated. I'm now I'm obviously voting, um, uh, and I'm now returning to the speaking list. Uh, Ms. Idlout, you have the floor uh, on the motion that is that was presented to us. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is a pleasure to um, represent the NDP uh, and I share the sentiments that were shared about my colleague, um, Blake Desjardins. Uh, I do wish him well during his time of grief. Um, I have complete faith in our whole party and what we've heard and the advice give us, given to us by our staff. So when I'm sharing my feedback, uh, it is because of what I'm what I've heard, and um, unfortunately, what I'm hearing uh, during this debate at committee is a lot of partisanship. When we should be demanding accountability, um, what I've heard from the witnesses, from the officials. And I appreciate uh, that it was based on a new motion. 
regarding this study uh, is that the officials were not able to answer my questions and inviting them back will mean that even if I repeat those questions to those same officials, they will not be answered. I understand that there were officials from the Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that such as pharma care. And I, I really don't think that's right to take all this time away. So um, uh, I just uh, like to propose um, an amendment to remove the report to the house. Thank you. Uh, again, Ms. Yip, I'm going to rule it out of order because that fundamentally changes the nature of the motion to uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to move that out of order. You're welcome, of course, to vote against it, which is effectively what your amendment is is doing. Um, you, you I, don't, I don't. Yeah, sorry, I don't. I don't believe that it's out of out of order. I'm, I'm going to challenge that. All right. Um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll call on my decision. Just give us a second. Shall the decision of the chair be sustained? Mr. Van Bynen? No. Mr. Provolowski? No. Ms. Kellyan? It's a, it's a no for me. Ms. Shanahan? No. Ms. Yip? No. Ms. Block? Ms. Block is signaling a yes. I record her vote as a yes. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Ms. Cousy? Yes. Monsieur Lemire? En favor. Ms. Edlow? Anirpunga, yes. Five yeas, five nays. The decision of the chair is sustained. Ms. Shipp, you still have the floor. Or I can uh, turn to your colleague, Ms. Shanahan. I just, I just feel that we are, I just wanna, I guess I can't go back to it, but I just feel that I wanna say that we are just removing something. We're not causing the motion to be out of scope. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shanahan, you have the floor. Yeah, I, Actually, I just, have to continue. Just one, uh, Ms. Ms. Clid, you had had your hand up some time ago, and, and it's not up now. I just want to confirm if, if, you're, if you're speaking after Ms. Shanahan, or if, you, if you'd like to speak at all. But you'll have to wait your turn. 
Of course, I, I, I love speaking, Chair, <laughs> yes. and I uh, will continue to, to speak as what my constituents uh, send me to Ottawa for. Uh, so, yes, I do reserve the rights to, to speak Very good. after Ms. Shannon. You'll be up after Ms. Shannon. Ms. Shannon, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, um, I would actually like uh, to have some clarification uh, uh, on uh, your ruling, on your decision to call that um, Ms. Yip's amendment out of scope because it is simply deleting uh, text from the, um, from the motion. It is not taking away at all from uh, the uh, invitation to have the minister come before this committee. Uh, I think it is entirely within the scope. And um, so for future reference, I would like to have that um, clarification. From the from the clerk. Well, this is this. Um, well, the, the clerk will will tell you what she just told me. It has been decided by this committee. The debate is back to the motion. You have the floor, Ms. Shanahan. Uh, that's very unfortunate uh, that we were not able to discuss this further because, again, uh, the practice of this committee has been to discuss uh, witness lists. Indeed, um, I've sat on other opposition chair, uh, chaired uh, committees, and it was always the practice of uh, the opposition chair to reach out uh, when we, uh, uh, for an upcoming study, to reach out to all sides for a witness list to discuss the scope of the study, a work plan, that the witness list would be indeed uh, proportionate uh, to uh, the membership around uh, the room, although I can remember in both government operations and ethics committee that uh, members were generous with the allocation of time. And if a witness was deemed to be of interest um, to other members, uh, regardless of who had suggested the witness, that the witness would be heard. And uh, it is... Um, uh, unfortunate that uh, that we are, and I have a feeling, unfortunate but deliberate, right, to um, put us uh, in this position uh, that we have to basically be defending just what would be the normal, respectful procedures of this committee. We have already stated that we are gripped with the, uh, I'm going to say in French, the ampleur, the, the, the depth of this uh, uh, problem, what happened here, how horrific it is that uh, in trying to put together a tool that would effectively collect information in a digitized form, which, you know, we're all going to that, uh, to that technology and, um, it would have been preferable if it had been developed before the pandemic, but there you have it. We were in an emergency situation and uh, that there were bad actors that took advantage of that time to, uh, however they did it, uh, the um, uh, cozy contracting arrangements or you know, fraudulent uh, representation, whatever it was, uh, that they were uh, uh, engaged in during a time when uh, people were, of course, physically isolated and uh, communication uh, was uh, limited. Uh, that it, 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 um, uh, it, this is an issue that rightfully so we should be uh, looking at because indeed uh, the Auditor General had already signaled that uh, arrive can was of concern to her when we heard her uh, after the first arrive can report, which had to do with the actual uh, value of the application itself, which did serve to save lives because it did speed up and uh, more accurately uh, send out the information to provinces and territories regarding travelers and who needed to be quarantined and and so on so you know you had a chair we wanted to study this as well especially when the auditor general presented us with her report on 
the whole uh, contracting um, and the uh, process and the, the lack of proper documentation, we were all horrified. But apparently that was not enough for, I won't even call them, they're not even, uh, some of the members here have been subbed in and out so many times, they actually forget which committee they're speaking at. And they refer to testimony that has occurred in other committees. I'm not even sure if, 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 uh, if they were uh, uh, right in doing so. Uh, flagrant disregard for the way that this committee runs. And Chair, frankly, I expected better of you in this respect, to put us in this position time and time again, where we could have very easily had the discussion, whether in a subcommittee, although that's not normally a practice of this committee, normally it, these discussions, witness lists and so on, point would order. be in the... Yes, Ms. Idlow, do you have a point of order? Yeah, I just, I'm, I would like, if you could ask the member to get back to what we're trying to debate, the motion that this is not a motion Relevant. to question the process or the committee. Uh, if you could Thank please you. ask the yeah. member to get back on point. Yeah, Ms. Shannon, if I, if, I, if I could, I am the servant of the committee, motions come before me and I don't often have advance notice and I would ask that you come back to the question at, uh, at hand. Well, uh, Chair, I'm I'm sorry that the member feels this way because uh, I Ms. Ms. Shannon, so so does the chair. So I'd I'd ask you to stay focused uh, on the question at hand. Well, the question at hand is that this motion could be could have been dealt with uh, in a in a uh, consensual way in the committee where we would have invited the minister if that was the will of the committee. We could have invited the minister in the normal. Uh, way that we have uh, done in the past. Indeed, uh, we have uh, had uh, the occasion to have a minister, including the Minister of Indigenous Affairs in front of this committee. And, uh, and that was at the express request of uh, the NDP member. And uh, for this side, I can't speak for the other side, but for this uh, side of the uh, committee, uh, we were very happy to uh, uh, support that request and to allocate that time. And indeed, it would be something that um, we would uh, be happy to do in the future. Uh, but um, right now, what we've got before us is a motion that is going to waste valuable committee time, valuable House of Commons time, because this reporting to the House of Commons, make no mistake, it is a showboat exercise where uh, we will be wasting time in the house, time that could be spent on valuable legislation such as pharmacare, and that will hurt Canadians across the country. Um, but I think we know what uh, the official opposition's intentions are in that regard. They don't want pharmacare for Canadians, so they're doing everything they can to block it. And Chair, I will finish on that. Thank you. Before I turn things over to you, Ms. Khalid, just uh, um, I've been able to secure resources to 8 p.m. I've had a few members asking me on the side. So just so everyone knows, um, uh, we, will, we, we have resources because no other committees are sitting today. Ms. Khalid, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And um, as talented as I as I may be on uh, on my speaking, I, I doubt that any any one of us uh, want me to go on till 8 p.m. Uh, with um, with the the arguments here today. And you know, Chair, as I, as I said before, I have no problems with the minister coming in. And if that's if that's the will of the committee, so be it. But I'm just trying to ultimately get to the like, what is our end goal here? What are we trying to achieve as a committee? And that was the nature of, of all the points that I was trying to raise today. Like, why are we doing this? What can we do to be helpful, not hurtful to the process, to the public trust, to ensuring that going forward, uh, the, the, the procurement process is, is in a better way, that we don't see this kind of 
bad nature happen again. So that we see that people are held to account. So I am more than happy to go to a vote now on this chair and uh, and looking forward to to whatever the, the will of the committee is at this time. Thank you, Ms. Khalid. Uh, Clerk, could you please call the vote? Call the roll call. Shall the motion of Garnet Genuis carry? Mr. Van Bynen. Yes. Mr. Provolowski. Yes. Ms. Khalid. Yes. Ms. Shanahan. Yes. Ms. Yip. Yes. Ms. Block. Mr. Barrett. Uh, sorry, Ms. Ms. Block uh, voted in the affirmative. Is that I wasn't, yes. Ms. Block voted in the affirmative for everyone. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Cousy. Uh, yes, I would also advise Mr. Pulowski to please mute himself. Thank you. Mr. Lemire. Mr. Lemire, just an excuse. En favor. Uh, Ms. Edla. Angatonga, yes. 10 yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion uh, is 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 passed to refer to the House. Uh, this concludes the business before this committee. We'll see one another bright and early uh, on Tuesday, March 19th. We have the lockup with the uh, Auditor General's team from 7 to 9 a.m. At 9 a.m., there'll be an in-camera briefing from the Auditor General of Canada on her uh, reports that she is tabling that day. I will actually just give you the titles of that so you and the public have it. The three reports will be, uh, the audits will be on transportation corridors and supply chains, housing on First Nation reserves, and First Nations and in Inuit policy programs. And that those reports will be tabled at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. or soon thereafter, and there'll be a special meeting of this committee at 10 o'clock where the auditor will uh, publicly pronounce on those reports and take questions from members for approximately one hour. Does it please the committee that I adjourn? Here, here. Very good. Have a great rest of the recess break. Thank you, everyone.